All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm opening the House Finance Executive Session on HB1 and HB2. We'll start with Division 1, which will present their recommendations to the full committee. Division 2 and Division 3 may not be familiar with what Division 1 has been doing, as each other division is working in their own place. After each division presentation, a motion will be made to accept that report. Then it will be open to further amendments from the committee members. If any member has a prepared amendment to offer the committee, they must do so today, after all the division presentations. At the end of all votes today, please make the following, and I will do that. So we'll begin with Division One, and I'll represent, I'll, I'll uh, recognize Representatives Leishman and McGuire, as well as their LBA, um, to, to give them a little help if they need it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sure we may need a little help. Uh, you can see by the size of our packet that we had quite a bit of work to do, and we did a lot of work. But before I get started, I'd like to recognize the two people that really made this successful for us, uh, Melissa on my right and Mike on my left. Without the two of them, we'd probably still be uh, somewhere else instead of before you. Um, Melissa came to us, she's new to the division, but you'd never know it. Uh, she was incredible, did a great job. And then I'd like to turn to the members of my division. Uh, I can tell you that when the speaker asked me to chair the division, I thought it was easier when I probably chaired the last time when we were in the majority, but being in the equals, so to speak, minority majority. I thought it might be challenging. It turned out to be not challenging at all. Um, the members were incredible. Representative Griffin and I, as far as the people sitting here today, were the only ones returning to Division I. Everybody else was new to Division I. And uh, the amount of work that we faced was uh, at times daunting, but uh, we got through it. It was very nonpartisan. I, joke with my members that we had the professor with us that's sitting to my immediate left. He helped get us through all the tough details and uh, again we'll start out and if anyone has any questions feel free to go through the chair and we'll try to answer them. So Mr. Chairman I don't know where you'd like to start the big document here or we have uh, some smaller documents it's, it's up to you I guess. I leave the choice to you. All right, well. I should uh, recognize we have some replacements with us. Yeah. Representative Kofalt uh, replacing Representative Hole, And as usual, although he's almost a permanent replacement, Representative Grassy replacing Representative Hatch. And who are we, who are we missing over Bill here? McGuire. Oh, Representative McGuire replacing Representative Bean, thank you for coming. So what we can do is we'll start with a big packet. I try not to be extremely detailed, but a lot of this is uh, self-explanatory, I hope. Uh, but starting with House Bill 1, you'll see we have an amendment. Um, it'll be on page 3 of your packet. We'll start at that location. Is everybody sure where they are or know where they are? Okay, good. So uh, you'll see the First Amendment is a recommendation to abolish three positions. They're unfunded, uh, but what we're gaining here is we're actually adding two multi-state auditors. Uh, they will be out there looking for, if you will, tax cheats or whatever in the big corporate world outside of New Hampshire. So the DRA asked that we could add a few more people. This gives us a positive balance because they will be out there finding additional revenue for the state. Um, going right along, we have um, the estimate of unrestricted revenues. The division found itself, this is on page four. I'll try to Again, if anyone has any questions, just you know, put your hands up and we'll s slow down. Uh, 
so you'll see at the bottom of the page, Representative Buko, there's a number. That's what we're following. Okay, thanks. Um, so the division found itself in kind of an interesting position uh, back on the 12th of March. We found that we had, between the House bills we were getting and the governor's budget, we were about $145 million where we shouldn't be. So uh, that's why you'll see as we go through this where there's some cuts uh, going on to page six of your package. We have two DOIT positions. There's a privacy officer and administrative positions. I believe these were from a bill that Representative Edwards had introduced at some time. Uh, just kind of buttoning things up and bringing some more security to DOIT. So now we go to House Bill 2. So this item, get to the right page here, that's page seven. Uh, there's an amendment in your package that uh, authorizing the DES to seek higher bonding authority. Right now it's been limited to three. You'll see it's up to 30 million. That's what we're proposing there. Again, if I'm going too fast, please sing out. Uh, moving on to page eight. We have an appropriation for uh, PCB contamination. We have a question, Representative Edwards. Representative Edwards. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, <clears throat> um, Representative Leishman. I, I just, uh, I was just a little slow on the interpretation on uh, page six for the DOIT chief privacy officer, and and I had two bills this year that sounded very similar to one another. One was for the, a privacy officer for DHHS and a separate bill for a security officer for DOIT. N neither of those were privacy officers for the DOIT, even though they sound similar. And <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not opposed to this. I, I just, you read into the testimony that this came from one of my bills and, and I don't believe that's, that's accurate. All right, I apologize. I do remember there was some discussion about a privacy officer with your bill, so I yes, made sir. probably the assumption that I should have made that this may have come from what you had introduced. Right, right. And because on the D DOIT uh, security officer, that was already funded. That was just putting into statute the obligations of the security officer. The, the, the money for the privacy officers in DHHS come in Division Three. Th thank you. All right, thanks that, for the correct. Carol McGuire for a question. Actually, it's a comment. When we were talking about the uh, security officer in EDNA, we, the commissioner of DOIT mentioned that he thought having a chief privacy officer of the DOIT was a good idea and he would consider putting it in the budget. And so this may have been a request from DOIT that got in, had to be added as an amendment. That was my recollection to Representative McGuire, but hopefully we've cleared it up. <laughs> Representative Irf has a question. Uh, thanks for taking my question. If we're done with that one, I'd like to ask you a question about Section 35 in HB2, which I think you were just getting to, if I'm not mistaken. Page seven. Yeah, page seven. Could you just speak to the increase from $3 million to $30 million in that amendment? So my memory, I recall that the Department of Environmental Services said that $3 million really constrains them, and they asked it to be raised to uh, $30 million for bonding authority. This was something we did run by the treasurer at the time, and she didn't see any particular problem with the request. So this is not an appropriation, it's a, it's a bonding? It's an authorization, a bond authorization amount. Thank that you. They cannot exceed $30 million. Thank you. And the Treasurer usually advises, there's mm -hmm. another very important bill that will come before the, the House, and that will be capital budget, which is usually HB 25. And that's always constrained by 6% of the, of the total budget, or total general fund and education fund budget. So they have to stay below that uh, they have to stay below that 
when they do any borrowing because it affects the, the credit rating. So I'm sure the treasurer has spoken to them as well on this same one. Thank you. And Representative McGuire would like to add to it. Yeah, so in the original House Bill 2, uh, it just simply removed the $3 million cap, so the cap became unlimited. So we decided that unlimited was not correct, so we, we put in this limit. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So next we have the uh, PCB contamination. There was a $1 million sum here for uh, investigating and remediation of PCB contamination. Moving to Amendment 9, uh, you'll see this was in Section 40 and 41 of House Bill 2, and the division felt that creating the Office of Regulatory Review and Reduction was not needed. It was about a $750,000 request, I believe, for this. So we took that out. That was in the governor's HB2. So then we move to page 10. And it won't go as slow as this because once we get to OPLC, we'll go through about 100 pages. So, <laughs> uh, um, And if any member has a question, push your uh, button so I'll see the red light quicker than I might see you nodding or waving. So the next one was dealing with historic housing preservation. Uh, we were looking for additional information on this. We did not get it, uh, but there is a bill in the Senate that has passed, I believe it's 231, and the Senate put it on the, their table. So there is a like legislation in the Senate for this. Uh, also going to page, um, let's see, tax credit, did that one. So Invest New Hampshire, um, there's been some concern that uh, the division cut this by $15 million. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of this, we had to make some cuts in order to get where we should be. Uh, I'd like to actually thank Representative Sweeney, who uh, added some language in an amendment to take developers out of receiving this money and make it more of a grant to communities. Is that how I interpreted that correctly? Thanks. So I th think it was a good move, but we at least kept $15 million in there. We made it more of a grant program for communities versus a loan program. This is new money. This is uh, general fund dollars. Uh, initially, all the money that had been put into Invest New Hampshire was federal money. So this is a new general fund request. So we have the affordable housing, which uh, as you'll see, we also reduce that down to $15 million. Again, we support the program, but we just didn't have the money to fully fund it at $25 million. The next item we have is on, noted as page, um, I just have to consult with my chief advisor here. My page is not beginning to line up. In the right-hand column, they, they do. Yeah, yeah apparently my, my numbers, there's been so many sheet changes here, but so... Uh, Going down, so we've gotten through uh, 11, so on page 12. Yeah, look at the we number the in the Department right hand of, column. They do line up. Yep. Uh, we have the uh, Department of Correction. There's a sum of $10 million for the uh, surveying, design, completion, and pre uh, preliminary work for a new men's state prison. There was a Another amount going to 13, where we had an appropriation in the governor's budget of $40 million. We didn't feel that $40 million at this point could be funded, so we re removed the $40 million from 
House Bill 2. That was for the second stage of the design and work for the men's state prison. So we've had a lot of discussion on the parking garage. You probably recall there was <clears throat> House Bill 384, uh, which appropriated funds for the parking garage that has made it through this committee in the full house. The uh, appropriation that the governor put in was for $15 million, so we removed the $15 million from the governor's request in House Bill 2. So moving on to page 15, uh, this is the Krista McAuliffe Memorial Fund. Initially, this had been completely removed from House Bill 2, except for the creation of this new commission. Uh, but with the encouragement of Representative Ebel, we uh, put $100,000 into the program. So we did fund it some. Hopefully, there will be enough money to get them started. Again, that original appropriation was for $500,000. So going to page 16 through 28, uh, this was quite a process. Uh, for those of you that have been following this along, this was House Bill 436. Uh, it came out of the ED and A committee with a very strong vote and it passed on the House floor by 282 to 80. And Representative McGuire was very, Representative Dan McGuire, <laughs> Uh, was very involved with this whole process. As a matter of fact, that's where we tagged him with the professor of the division <laughs> because he gave us about an hour and a half lecture on how this works or should work. So I don't want to take any of his work away from him. So Representative McGuire, I know would like to comment on this one. Yes, thank you. So um, House Bill 436, in, in the minds of the sponsors, writes a wrong um, that we did in the budget 12 years ago. 12 years ago, we had a very tight budget and we needed money. And um, at the time, we were sending a lot of money for retirement to communities. And, and sort of to, to compensate a little bit, we um, reduced retirement benefits in some in in a couple of different ways both for group one and but especially for group two and in particular for group two which is police and fire some of which are state employees and but most of them are municipal employees um, we for for employees who were at the time working but not yet vested um, we reduced the multiplier that goes into their pensions. So in general, a pension is based on number of years of service, times um, average final compensation, times some particular multiplier. And at the time, that multiplier for group two was two and a half percent. So for the employees who were um, working at the time but not yet vested, that became a ladder. For some of them, it became 2.4%, 2.3%, 2.2%, 2.1%, or 2%. And then for, for new employees who were hired after that point, it is now 2%. So, so that's a considerable difference, right? If it had been 2.5%, becomes 2%, that's, that's a 20% reduction in a pension. Um, so this bill restored those, for, it only affects or primarily affects those employees who were at the time working but not yet vested, right? There's no change for employees who had not yet been hired at that time and no change for those who were already vested, those, those hadn't been affected. So this bill, House Bill 436, Basically, for those employees, that, that particular group, and I believe it's roughly 1,500 employees, both municipal and state, um, this bill, House Bill 436, puts them back on, um, 
having the same retirement plan they had when they were hired. Um, okay. Now, um, there's one... Um, we made one change to the bill as it came to us because, um, and it's not quite the same. I mean, there's, there are detailed changes, but, but we made one particular change to the bill at the suggestion of the sponsors, which was um, there's an overall cap on the retirement of these, this particular set of employees of $125,000 a year. And in the original bill, that cap was to have been have an escalator so that the cap would be raised by one and a quarter percent per year over time. It affects very few employees, but it's an expensive number, and so that that escalation was taken out of House Bill 36. But other than that, this is the same as House Bill 36. This is the most e expensive part of our whole division. It's paid for by $25 million a year over a 10-year period. So this is not just affecting this current biennium, $25 million a year, so $50 million in this biennium, but the next four bienniums, another $50 million, okay? So it's very expensive, paid for by general funds. Um, there's also a payment, just to, a, a little bit extra, just to make sure that um, uh, cities and towns are not affected, the, the, their employer rates are not affected by this bill. Now, this particular amendment has a compromise. Because we are spending so much money here um, over time, this all, amendment also restores the communication ta services tax. That's a tax that raises roughly 56, 57 million dollars a year, i sorry, a biennium, 28 point something million dollars a year. And so it's a match for the expenses in House Bill 436 over time. Um, the governor's budget had eliminated that particular tax. As a, as a compromise, this, this amendment also sunsets the interest and dividends tax one biennium early. So, um, so the, in current law, the, the uh, interest and dividends tax w is eliminated on January 1st of 2027. This amendment uh, eliminates it on uh, January 1st of 2025. All right, so two years earlier than it would have been otherwise. So the net result of this amendment is it makes this particular group of Group 2 employees whole. It, um, it uh, has a funding mechanism, namely the communication tax, ongoing to pay for that expense, but it does sunset the interest and dividends tax two years early. I can explain why that's important from economic terms, if you like. It's something I've talked about to uh, the various ways and means committees over the years, um, but that's what this amendment does. Representative Uriff has a question. Uh, just by way of clarification, so in HB 2, this refers to 101 to 1, sections 101 to 110, and I did read your amendment, but I couldn't read it top to bottom. Are 101 to 110 deleted in your amendment in their entirety? Yes, those are the sections that, that remove the communication services tax. Okay. I mean, it talks about all kinds of other things, but they're all related to the communications and services tax? Yes, because the communication services tax has kind of little pieces scattered throughout law, right? So, you know, they're in a list of taxes, da da da, communications tax, da da. So, so House Bill 2 originally eliminated that, so it had a lot of sections because it, you know, takes the name out of this part, takes the name out of that part, those kind of things. Thank you. Representative Walner has a question followed by Representative Stringham. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative McGuire. So the uh, acceleration of eliminating the IND tax, the interest and dividends tax, have you done some estimates of how much you would estimate the um, next biennium 
will lose because of that um, decision? Uh, we have done a, um, let's see, the analysis that we were able to put together working with the LBA, the impact on FY26 is $57 million. FY28, $25 million. I'm sorry, did I say 28? I meant to say 27. Thanks, Melissa. But again, so again, 57 for 26 and 25 for 27. But the overall impact of this amendment over the for the next biennium is about a negative $25 million because of the res restoration of the communication services tax. Right, so those two taxes, um, yes, the interest and dividends tax going away is minus 75 to, to 80 million, but the restoration of communication services tax is plus 58 or so million. So the net is in the 25 million range. So uh, Representative Stringham followed by Representative Tolerski. So in addition to the 85 million in the next biennium, we're looking at about an additional 18 million for the interest and dividends tax on this, this biennium. I think that's correct. And the other two, um, and I'm just asking you to confirm that. And then second, really, really the, um, uh, the HB 436 provision and the CST pretty much balance out, especially since CST is anticipated to decline slowly. Does that sound about correct? Well, what, uh, what we have here, again, looking at the uh, fiscal analysis that was done for uh, us concerning 24 and 25, the uh, net gain for this biennium would be $40 million with the restoration of the communications tax. Now, indeed, the next biennium will have a a hit, but as far as this biennium, what we've done by restoring the communications tax is a net gain of forty million dollars. Um, follow up. Follow up. Is, is that just in isolation by itself, right, and not not including the impact of including four thirty six and the change in the I and D tax, or are you offsetting the I and D tax and not? HB no, that's, that's an isolation, a gain of $40 million for the biennium. Okay, thank you. Representative Tolerski for a question. Thank you. Representative Walner asked one question I had. My other one was um, the communication tax restoration. Did you get um, long-term numbers and projections on the decline of that and what we're looking at for fiscal year 26 and 27? We did not. We just focused on what we were doing for this biennium. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative McGuire yeah. would also like to weigh in on So the communication tax is a tax on phone calls and text, but not data. So it does not, some people think it's only on landlines. It's not. It's, it's uh, essentially 100% on landlines, but on cell phones, it's partial because some of your cell phone cost is associated with data and some is associated with calls and text. And so the reason it's declining is because, first of all, more people are using cell phones and less are using landlines, but also because over time, the amount of the cost allocated to a cell phone is lessening on, on talking and, and, ex and increasing on data. But it's not going to you know, people still talk on their phone. So, um, you know, it's declining, but slowly. Thank you. So I think, again, just adding a little more to this particular section, this is a correction of a wrong that was created back in 2011. Uh, I really want to thank the members of my division for coming up with, I think, a very workable solution to fund this. Um, and again, for those taking notes, we just got an update from um, our folks at retirement that it'll be about 1,824 people that would be affected by this legislation. So moving on to 
page 29, as I promised earlier, we'd make some <clears throat> significant jumps along the way. Uh, this is the uh, Special Injury Fund. It's a special fund that's been around a long time. It helps small employers deal with workman's comp claims if they're repeated claims, so people are uh, going to work and a claim that may have occurred at another employer isn't coming down on that employer's insurance company or that new employer. We heard from a number of folks, including some small business, New Hampshire Automobile Dealers Association, that it asked us to remove this from House Bill 2, in which we did. So page 30, um, <clears throat> natural and cultural resources. Uh, these used to be park funds. What we've done here is this will be funded through general funds and no longer park funds. I think we all know our parks are in dire financial straits, so the decision was made to fund this with general funds versus park funds, and you'll see the amount there is about 800000 a little more than $800,000. So this right. was an... This was an add-on, Representative McGuire. Yeah, so as we understand it, historically, this was funded with general funds. It was only park funds in the last biennium. So going to 31, uh, this is a very simple change, was requested from the Department of Agriculture just to uh, move the meetings to semi-annual versus quarterly. Uh, and to allow some more public input at those particular meetings. And no money was involved in this. So, yeah, so Representative Dan McGuire just laughed in my, the next one here. So, so OPLC, um, you probably have heard a little about this through your emails. There were uh, hundreds of sections that were proposed in the governor's budget to change. Uh, I want to personally thank Representative Carol McGuire. I think she's joined us here today just to make sure we do what's right with this. Um, also, it, her husband, Dan, worked very uh, hard with us. Representative um, Groda was very much involved as ranking member of the uh, EDNA committee. And what we did is we eliminated the entire section uh, from top to bottom, and we started uh, looking at those agencies that uh, we had not heard from, minor technical changes, but the areas that we heard loud and clear from, that from so many people around the state, those were not put in. We thought it more appropriate that eDNA take a thorough look. We didn't feel that the division could really do its due diligence in such a short period of time to address these changes. And I'd like to turn it over to Representative McGuire, who can speak to some of the smaller boards that we did, in fact, uh, move from the Secretary of State's office to OPLC. Uh, the other thing that was concerning for us on a financial matter, if we took the changes that had been suggested, we'd lose about $998,000 in general fund money that comes from OPLC. So there was a financial piece, but more importantly, we turned to EDNA. And again, thanks, uh, Representative McGuire, for your leadership and getting us here. Representative McGuire, Dan McGuire. Okay. Well, I could turn it over to <laughs> the other represent. Let, let, let me just explain. So, first of all, um, the last bit of what Representative Leishman said, I think is incorrect in the sense that um, the House passed a bill that makes um, OPLC an independent, independent of the general fund, right? So they'll be, they'll be self-funded from their licensing fees. So that was always, that was in House Bill 2, but it's also in uh, a bill that we just passed. And so I think that from now on, anyways, that uh, licensing will not be, they, they will be charging license fees um, equal to their costs so that it will not be a, a moneymaker, licensing will not be a moneymaker for the general fund. Um, in Essentially, we took out of this section, uh, it, I personally think that the governor's um, 
uh, initiative here is well is is was a good one and long overdue we we license we have occupational licensing way in excess of most other states um, including our neighboring states like Vermont um, who have very thoughtful and and limited occupational licensing by comparison to us it's not an area where New Hampshire is particularly good in my opinion so so I like the governor's proposal. It just turned out to be way too much for our division to process and, and deal with the level of detail involved. It's really something that has to be done by the eDNA committee. And given the, all the help they gave us, we really cut this down to the, to the bare bones. Um, the main person who's going to be happy with what we have left is the Secretary of State, because the Secretary of State will no longer be doing licensing for for the couple of very tiny board, uh, you know, professions that that he was de dealing with. Um, but we've kept um, a few re a few removals. There's there's in particular there's four very tiny areas that have never caused problems that are that are being delicensed here um, that's the uh, athlete agents the um, hawkers and peddlers itinerant vendors and one uh, no boxing is being moved to OPLC um, I think there was one other one. Oh no allied health is not a removal of a license maybe it was just those three uh, yeah so um Allied, then there's a couple of sort of consolidations, in particular Allied Health. So Allied Health used to be the, the like an OPLC of its own. There were there were half a dozen small boards, and and Allied Health was kind of an extra layer. Allied Health previously had been moved into o OPLC, so it was a redundant layer. So so one of the things is this that layer is going away. There's a few other small cleanup type things. But, but all the, the, the changes that were getting you, hundreds and hundreds of emails, those are all gone from this amendment. So it's a very minimal amendment. It, it does a lot of cleanup, but, it, but not in an in a at all controversial way. Question, Representative Edwards. Uh, uh, thank you to the uh, the McGuire duo uh, <laughs> and Division One. I, I I think this was great work. I agree with you that the governor's initiative was was bold and moves us in the right direction. And I see where where you're taking us in this this bite at the apple. What what do you think comes next? What you know? Where are we in the? Uh, okay, so what's next? We'll let Carol McGuire answer that. Thank you. Uh, the, o the EDNA committee has two retained bills and two Senate bills and several Senate bills coming to us that we're hearing this, this coming this week and next. So we intend to work, first of all, on the parts that we specifically wanted to take out of House Bill 2. The entire committee was agreed they should not be in House Bill 2, and that's the restructuring of the mental health boards the Psychologists Board of Mental Health and the um, Latex. We have those, those three boards have been an issue. And so we are going to be working on what we should do about them, looking at the licensing requirements and the way they operate. Um, so that's one part. We're also looking specifically at the LNA license, which the governor wanted to delete, but we're not entirely sure that his equivalency with the national certification is right because there are significant differences in scope of practice. So those two pieces we're going to be looking at um, while we look at the Senate bills. Other items we will continue to look at. There is an OPLC oversight board that is now being formed that we expect to give us other suggestions like making more governing board, advisory and governing boards rather than full-fledged regulatory boards. But that's, that's a separate issue. We expect we'll get to that next year. 
Uh, th thank you, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing no further questions, please proceed. All right, I guess <clears throat> we can uh, jump down to page 56. Um, but actually, before I go, I, Melissa did mention to me there was a, a House bill that passed on consent last week, which I must have missed. We're thinking it was 656, which um, eliminated the lapsing of OPLC. So what I stated earlier, apparently that wouldn't have been the case a week ago, but with the passage of this bill, now all money will stay within OPLC. But you could probably help us yes. out, Representative that, McGuire. That section was included in House Bill 655. It's also included in House Bill 445, I believe, or 455, which is in Ways and Means at the moment. They're considering how to handle the non-lapsing fund. OPLC has always been self-funded from license fees. What uh, many of us are concerned with is that by maintaining fees at a level that lapses uh, three or four million to the general fund, it's becoming a tax rather than a fee. And so we want to uh, keep it more t focused on the act at just covering the costs of the uh, actual OPLC operations. So I think we'll probably look forward to a reduction in licensing fees. We, we, the first thing we're that is in process is a realignment because some boards are generating a great deal more than they cost and some boards are generating much less than they cost. So there will be some realignment expected fairly soon. Thank you. Okay, moving on to... Uh... Page 56, Mr. Chairman. This was just giving the uh, consumer advocate, which is within the Department of Energy, um, the ability to move funds around for consulting or litigation, but the transfers are limited to $75,000. So now we go to page 57 through 58. Uh, many of you probably recall this was a House Bill 347 was introduced by Representative Lind, I believe, to have a land use judge. Again, this has gone through the process, passed House, um, and it's just adding an additional, you'll see in the judicial budget later, they've added the one additional Superior Court judge to their budget. But this specifically was to try to handle the land use cases at this Superior Court. So going on to page 59, uh, Department of Corrections for position relocation allocation. Uh, again, we don't see an awful lot of money here, but uh, is that's why you're seeing the language the governor may draw a warrant for, for general funds. But uh, again, we've had a real problem with uh, staffing, at, as you all know, at our state prisons. So this is looking further into pay classifications and other assessments in the uh, Department of Corrections. Page 60, again, all about expansion, recruiting, retention program, uh, various, the Department of Corrections has put together quite a document dealing with recruitment and retention. Again, this kind of just ties into the same thing. Uh, again, we're still with corrections. This is on page 61. This was brought forward by the commissioner um, as far as a burial expense, uh, trying to help families uh, that have lost someone that's worked for the corrections department. There was a loss recently at the corrections department and the commissioner felt uh, we should at least provide some sort of funding for that expense. And it was not to exceed $10,000. Page 62, um, we heard from the Department of, oh sure, Representative McGuire. I'd just like to comment on the direct, uh, Department of Corrections um, because this is an, a department that is in dire straits. Um, 
their employees, they, they have roughly 50% of the number of correctional officers that they really need to run the prisons. And so the correctional officers that we do have are working a lot of overtime. Um, so uh, one I spoke to says he's working 64 hours a week. So, so 24 hours a week, well, maybe slightly more, uh, of required overtime. He has no choice about working overtime. And in addition to that, parole officers who normally don't work in the prison at all are working up to maybe 16 hours or so of overtime. And in addition to that, um, National Guard members are working in the prison. So, so they are significantly shorthanded. So, so in a sense, we, r rather than fund building a new prison, we put in as much as they asked for, for operations and, and improving their situation in operations. And part of that is going to be um, getting some of their officers reclassified into higher grade levels so they, they can be paid more and hopefully help them with recruiting in that way. But this is an area that, that really needs help. And anything we can do, just as general advice, anything we can do similar to the juvenile case to, risk, to lower the number of uh, people going into prison would be helpful as well. So something to think about anyway. Representative Edwards has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you mentioned the National Guard are, have been deployed into the uh, corrections system. Um, not everyone appreciates that the National Guard come from the community, come from employees of the private sector or other state agencies. And so when they get mobilized, they end up being unavailable to work their regular job. And so... Um, so I think it's it's a particularly bad sign when we deploy the state National Guard into a mission like this because it's distracting and they're supposed to be available for, for other crises that are not man-made. This is a man-made crisis we should try to solve, I think. It's, and then you could make that a question, I suppose. Do you agree? Yes. <laughs> Representative McGuire? Yes, thank you. Uh, the corrections situation is one that essentially convinced me to vote for House Bill 436. Corrections officers are considered policemen for the purposes of the pension system, and the state employees who are affected by House Bill 436 are overwhelmingly the corrections officers, not the state police. So they are some of the people that most need the pension improvements and we have heard that they are going to stick around a little longer because of house bill 436 and the pension improvements so i hope that will help seeing no further questions please continue thank you mr chairman moving on to page 62 uh, we heard from the Department of Agriculture, again, this was a bill, House Bill 230, uh, that they were way behind the times in, as far as their uh, electronic licensing and certification, registration. So this is a one-time ask of $360,000 for them. They're presently occup um, acting in, as he said, probably the 18th century when it comes to uh, running their department. Moving on to another very important topic that was discussed at length within the division is uh, House Bill 300. Uh, I probably should turn this over to Representative Ebel, who was, no, she's shaking her head. No. <laughs> so again, this is something that Representative Ebel and others have worked on for a long period of time. Uh, trying to get a handle on uh, food waste disposal. It does create a new position within the Department of Environmental Services uh, for about $98,000 in the second year of the biennium. This was a position that was supported overwhelmingly by the waste industry, waste management. I believe they came to testify and others. So we thought this was an important ad. 
I'm going next to uh, page 65 and 66. Um, I learned something with this one. I, they said they were, uh, this is again, the National Guard for Recruiting and Incentive Program. And they said that money would come from their fines. And I thought they were collecting their fines for traffic violations. And come to find out there are court marshals that aren't removal of the officers, but fines for infractions. So that's where the fine language comes from. But they're looking to expand their um, incentive programs for staying or signing up to be with the National Guard. Moving on to page 67, this is food waste reduction and diversion. This is another item that was uh, looked at very seriously by the division. It was a fairly large ask of $2 million, but the division felt uh, we should get a handle again on waste and where it's where and how, and uh, especially food waste disposal, which we found was uh, shocking, the amount of tonnage that we're loading up on our landfills with food waste. So that's where this came from. It came out of the Environment and Agriculture Committee unanimously. Uh, next, we have uh, page 68. This is requiring the uh, Liquor Commission to at least provide some notice. Again, this is something that I know Representative Emmerich's knowledgeable on and the uh, former chair of the finance committee sitting, I think, behind me keeping an eye on us. But we've just asked on the fiscal committee that we get some notice in advance of closing of liquor stores. And the executive council has actually been added to this, which we did not have in the original amendment that was offered two years ago by Representative Ober that was taken out by the Senate. Some years ago, we had an item before fiscal committee, and it was the closing of seven liquor stores. And I was reading it at home at the same time I had the annual report of the State Liquor Commission. And I looked, and it had several years of their sales and whether they were declining or increasing. And what do you know? The seven liquor stores that were on the list to be closed for, had all been, been declining in sales while almost all the rest, and I think there's about 42, almost all the rest were increasing in sales. So it was, it was an obvious business decision once you looked at the annual report. What was the effect? Why were they closing these? It has nothing to do with politics. We want to keep politics out of this. This is an ent entrepreneurial fund. We want them to make as much money as possible. So it's, it's used for good purposes, all the money that comes out of the, the um, liquor, li liquor sales. So I thought, yes, they had made good business decisions. I saw the evidence of it, so I would never question why they closed the store, and I don't think we should. I guess this is okay to have, a, to have some warning, especially for the people that are regular patrons, but also for the employees. And generally, they always find a, a new place for the employees. They keep the same number of liquor stores consistently. And as they find a better location, they move to it. And they get a pretty good rate on the rents as well. So this, this is okay. I don't want to see us get too involved in meddling with where the stores are placed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, moving on to page 69 through 70. Uh, those of you that are familiar with PFAS, probably everyone has heard of it. Uh, this is changing a few things. Right now it's a loan. If someone has been affected, we're looking to change it to a response fund. Two years ago, uh, we put about $25 million into this fund. There's about $12 million left. So that's it on that one. Next one is... Uh, 71, page 71, and I'm going to poke a little fun at my colleague to the left. <laughs> um, you probably recall that there was some excitement on the House floor last week. Again, this uh, House Bill 50, which this is, uh, sets aside $50 million towards the unfunded liability. Again, it did pass last week on the House floor, and some people were concerned that Representative McGuire's move to table this 
was a, a stunt to kill the bill. Well, it was a strategy that's not often used, but we thought it would work well. The House would vote to support this. And as Representative McGuire and all of us on Division want to discuss this, we thought it was a way to strengthen our position. And then this is just showing, yes, it is in the budget. So for those people that were concerned with the table like motion, that was the strategy. And Representative McGuire, I thought, was a, a pretty good strategy because of the importance of this particular item to us on the division. Would you like to comment further? Or? No, that's all right. Okay. Sure. Edwards for a question. All right, uh, thank you. I, I haven't I haven't been following this particular item very closely. Is is this the one that uh, goes into a direct payment on our unfunded liability? And the effect of that is it will reduce the amount of cost that needs to be shared with the uh, the subordinate elements of government and the individuals. You're absolutely correct. Yes. So this particular. Um, payment will this is actually 2023 funds so so as soon as the budget passes hopefully with this in it um 50 million dollars will will be transferred to the retirement system to pay down the unfunded liability the net effect will be that that the municipalities and the state will pay 105 million dollars less over the next couple of decades as we pay down this unfunded liability uh, and just just for comparison, what is fifty million as a, as a rough percentage of the total unfunded liability? It's extremely small, right? Yes, it's under one percent, close to one percent, but under one percent. All right, thank you. If there are no further questions, please continue. Moving to page. 72, uh, this is a RIM system that you probably heard about. There is an appropriation uh, in the uh, capital appropriation of $24 million. There was some concern by the commissioner that there may not be enough funding for this. So this gives uh, the department the ability to uh, seek further funds should they be necessary. So this next one, 73, this was a, uh, an amendment that was offered by Representative Weiler. Um, there, as all of you know, there's been some concern about getting House Bill 2 to us in, in a relatively quick fashion. Uh, so Representative Weiler has added this language that not later than February 15th of the year that the biennium session that we should have House Bill 2. So 74, um, again, this was, uh, there was an awful lot of discussion on this particular item. It's uh, House Bill 571, again, retirement. This was a cost of living adjustment for group two retirees. Uh, the division made it a one-time um, contribution towards, if you will, um, recognizing that people have seen great costs increase and group two employees haven't had any adjustment for some time. Representative McGuire worked on this and came out with what maybe some will say is a difficult scale as far as figuring this out. It wasn't everyone gets $3,000 or $2,000, but Representative McGuire worked on a sliding scale, which he may like to speak of, but the division felt it was fair based on time served with a maximum benefit of $3,000. I don't know if you'd like to add anything else. Or... Only if there's time. Only if there's questions. I don't see any questions. So seven, 76, again, an amendment that was off, offered by uh, Representative Weiler. This is often uh, just clear language as far as it's put in the budget every year, uh, providing reports to the uh, fiscal committee of where we stand. Uh, again, normal language, I believe. Quite often, requests come to the fiscal committee for another stipend add to a budget 
normally we say, where do you think we're going to get the money from? So this way we'll at least know if there's fairly good lapses coming around from all the other departments, then we know where the money will be coming from and we won't be overspending when we uh, approve an item in fiscal. Thank you. The next amendment, uh, which is identified as 77 in your packet, this was offered through uh, Representative Weiler and the Public Works Committee, um, something we weren't really familiar with, but short-term rentals for the different departments have to go through the Governor Council, which holds up projects, especially in emergencies. So we thought that uh, a waiver could be supported that short-term rentals would not need to be before the Governor and Council. Representative Weiler. Representative Carol McGuire. Yes, thank you. I'm looking back at on page 76. If this report to fiscal is something you it is included in the budget every year, why don't we add it to statute instead of leaving it in chapter law? Well, in effect, it will it will be in statute when we put it in HB two. Well, I I beg to differ that it it won't show up if you're looking up the many people, including many representatives, are not aware of chapter law, and find it difficult to find items that are only in chapter law, and therefore, if this is something that you want every year which sounds perfectly good to me, I think it should be under the duties of the Department of Administrative Services. And I'd like, I'd like to recommend that be the case. Thank you, I will follow up by filing a statute next year. But the problem was, um, you know, when we see fiscal, where's the money gonna come from? So anyway, thank you. So if they, Chair would like us to go to some of the uh, detailed changes that are significant or? Yes. Let's do that. So you'll notice a lot of items uh, have been changed, some have not been changed. So I'll try to hit some of the uh, more significant changes that we did by at least adding personnel or we did address a number of extra wants that were requested by a number of departments. Um, you'll see there's a lot of uh, duplication, if you will, for DOIT. There's one line that goes to DOT, but it's also the funding that comes from the agency to support DOIT. So people get somewhat concerned. They think it's double accounting, which it's just the way, unfortunately, we do things because DOIT is all other funds that come from either general funds or federal funds. But these are by category of of, uh, of the funds. What category is DOIT? And you'll see, like DOIT is all other funds, but they can in fact be federal or general funds. Uh, there were some ads as far as trying to uh, strengthen the Liquor Commission. They had requested additional uh, add-ons for software development or licenses, upgrading and maintenance of their existing uh, computer systems. If you go down to the Board of Land and Tax Appeals, there were some issues about case uh, management, data upgrades, that's on line 17. Uh, we talked about this earlier, about the support staff needed over at Liquor for, uh, again, positions to support their next-gen software. There are two positions there on line 19. And again, if I'm going too fast, just please put up your hand or... Um, Press your button so I'll see the red light. Again, this was mentioned earlier, some additional tech support for the Department of Revenue Administration on 20, line row 20. So let's see, it's some other. Uh, the commissioner of um, the Department of Administrative Services had a number of requests that were not included in House Bill 1 and uh, 
you'll see those on 25, and I think the uh, significant ones there is the space, the renovations going on at the annex of about $1.2 million that was requested. The commissioner, again, of DAS made a, a strong case that we're not keeping up with our facilities in the state, needs more money for maintenance, roofs, that sort of thing, upgrades, and that is $3.6 million for the biennium on line 26. Uh, you'll see a number of uh, departments, there were no change. We did make some change with the Office of Child Advocate. They needed additional funds for travel. They have to attend conferences out of state. Their travel line was pretty insignificant, so we added something there. Um, additional training funds, and also to fund a case management system. Uh, we were told that they were falling behind on keeping track of these cases, which has become problematic, so you'll see that additional want there of $200,000. Then going on to the next significant changes are line 48, uh, governor's page 52. Um, again, technical specialists uh, that will be with the RIM system. You'll uh, see going down there, vehicle fleet is in disrepair, so they've asked for additional funds for some additional uh, vehicle replacements. Something, again, it was mentioned earlier with the audit division are two new positions for out-of-state audits. Again, we saw that there'd probably be a significant generator there of revenue of, in the neighborhood of 1.5 to perhaps $2 million for the biennium. Again, as we, you know, cruise down through here, again, they... This is a good example going to Board of Tax and Land Appeals line uh, 65 on page four where I talked about that earlier with DOIT, there was a line for the 19.5, here you see it on their line. So it's, uh, they're making the appropriation which that amount of money will go over to uh, DOIT. Um, the other, the judicial branch, they. These were some significant reductions. There's quite a few of those that uh, the judicial branch came forward with, um, and we saw no reason to challenge any of their reductions. Um, a soil going down, again, continuing down, Department of Agriculture, Markets, and Food, that's line 15 on uh, a row 15 additional position for a soil conservation position. The commissioner made a very strong point that this was a necessary position, uh, and we agreed. Now, the Department of Justice had a number of requests that were granted by the governor, especially for elderly um, abuse. It's a, becoming a real problem within the state as our population ages. We're seeing more and more elderly abuse. So the division supported an additional person to work within the elderly of fraud unit. So this will be an attorney to work within the D Department of Justice. And this is one of their additional requests that we thought was uh, needed and should be funded. Uh, the other going down again, row 20, is just a simple transfer from uh, the Department of Justice or to the Department of Justice from the Department of Environmental Services, the Civil Bureau. Uh, this is, we we felt, and it was supported, of course, by the Attorney General that the uh, legal folks should be embedded within the, uh, secret uh, the uh, Justice Department and not perhaps embedded in the agency, but should work directly out of the Justice Department. So this is one of those changes. Um, then we go to transportation, uh, attorney position for the Transportation and Construction Bureau. So again, they'll be working with the Department of Transportation as far as their legal representation. Uh, a long spot of no changes. Again, the Liquor Commission, I uh, probably see those as uh, 
those were mentioned earlier on the DOIT section further in the front of the doc, uh, package. So going to page seven, uh, you see there was no changes in the uh, site evaluation, public utilities, and as Representative McGuire mentioned, we as a division fully supported corrections um, due to their ongoing issue with um, retention and operating their state prison system. So no change, and that's a significant part of our budget. All of that is primarily general funds. It's a, a huge chunk of money. We don't get a lot of support other than our general tax dollars for the state prison system. Going um, over to uh, the, I believe it's almost the last page, page eight. Uh, there was the uh, Bureau of Historic Sites. Uh, again, we spoke about, I think that earlier, the moving the fund from HB2 to HB1, general funds versus uh, park funds. And an item that has gained a little attention and uh, is going down to line nine, the New Hampshire Public Television. There was a request within governor's budget for $500,000 each year. Uh, there was a lot of debate within the division, but at the end of the day, I believe we were unanimous or very close to it with uh, not recommending the $500,000 as it was a new ask. Uh, there has not been an appropriation for New Hampshire Public Television since Representative Valancourt was here and <laughs> moved to have it stricken of all funding and that was about a decade ago. Uh, other issues I just draw your attention to because they're significant but there are other funds but this will have an impact to going down to line 17 or row 17 again. Uh, the Winnipesaukee River Basin. Uh, these funds are collected by the users. There are about uh, 10 communities that, um, this is a wastewater treatment plant that's around Lake Winnipesaukee towns and Lake Winnesquam. About 30,000 users. There's some deficiencies within the plant, uh, upgrades that are necessary. So the department asked that we would support this request. Again, these are funds that will be raised from the users, not the state, but does require the state to give their blessing. So the others uh, going down is uh, some, I guess, the one of the more significant things, uh, there's hazardous waste cleanup fund, uh, this is an alignment of including some positions that will be necessary there with the case was made to add some positions to deal with hazardous waste cleanup and also solid waste. The solid waste program, you're probably not aware, or maybe you are, that the state has several, two, I believe, uh, dumps that are now the responsibility, the responsibility of the state to maintain. So. Um, the owners can't be found or located, so the state has an obligation to continue to monitor those landfills, and there is a cost to that. So Representative McGuire and I are free to answer any questions, or if we're at a loss, which occasionally does happen, we can turn to our LBA staff to bail us out. Any, any member having a question, please push your red button so I can see it and identify, obviously, uh, okay. Representative Walner followed by Representative Stringham. Mike's just, I'm just gonna ask you to go back up to um, line 12 on page eight. I just wondered what the um, transfer of that position from legal aid to the Department of Justice was. I missed, I must have missed the description. Page eight. <laughs> What's that? That's from the transfer. Well, the Representative Walner has gotten a little below the weeds apparently for us, so. Uh, Mr. Hoffman is going to try to answer that question. 
the Department of Environmental Services has various um, administratively attached boards and they rely on the Department of Justice for hearings and those sorts of um, procedural things. And this would move a position that was in environmental services over to justice for that purpose. Representative Stringham for a question. Yeah, if it's okay, I'd like to go back to an earlier uh, line. Is that okay? Yes. Sure. Um, we have already included, uh, this uh, is follow up on the HB 436 uh, amendment. And uh, we had already included IND uh, reductions uh, in this budget. Uh, and in a biennium where we're seeing real reductions in revenues and increases in costs driven by inflation, I would have thought you might have advanced uh, stopping future decreases or at least holding future decreases in IND, not accelerating uh, the next biennium uh, reductions. I think you offered to uh, say why you thought that was important, and uh, I, I, I would like to give you an uh, opportunity to talk about that. Thank you very much, Representative. Um, I do think it's very important. In my mind, the interest in dividends tax is the most economically destructive tax that we have, and, and here's why. Essentially, when, when people have money, there's two things they can do with it. They can spend or they can save. And as we know, um, when we tax something, we get less of it. And the interest in dividends tax is specifically a tax on savings. Lots of our other taxes are taxes on spending, um, and some taxes are sort of intermediate in the sense that um, we don't know what, whether they're a tax on, on spending or savings because there's some combination there. For example, um, let's take the communication tax, for example. That's a tax on spending, right? It's a tax on spending on uh, use of phones, use of, use of communication. The tax on business profits and business enterprise, that could be a tax on either. We don't know if, if a business had more money, would they consume, would they, t would they spend more, or would they save? Would they uh, put money towards capital projects? But the interest in dividends tax in particular is a tax on savings. It's a tax on investment. And savings and investment in economic terms is what makes tomorrow better than today. It's, it's um, in order to, if, if you simply consumed everything you produce, so in general, you cannot um, consume more than you produce, that, right? That, that produces debt, which is sort of negative um, economic activity. But um, if you uh, tax savings, and have less savings, that makes tomorrow not as good as it would have been otherwise, right? So, so when you save money and invest money, that makes tomorrow better than today. And, and in economic terms, that's happiness, right? That's, that's um, as long as things are better, right? As if tomorrow's better than today, if the day after that is better than that, and the day after that is better than that, we have a rising standard of living, we have uh, rising incomes and so on. If instead we tax savings, like the interest and dividends tax, we cut down on how good tomorrow is, and that's making life worse. That's making, um, uh, that's reducing our standard of living compared to what it would have been otherwise. So in general, um, we want to increase savings, we want to increase the economic activity in the future, that makes things better to the extent that we, this is another reason why I want to pay down debt faster with things like House Bill 50, because to the extent we have debt, debt is the opposite of savings and it's making things worse in the future. So, so in general economic terms, um, we want the future better than today and, and um, the, the interest in dividends tax is specifically poor in that regard. Any other questions from the committee? Please push your mic button so I can see the red light. Representative Talerski for a question followed by Representative Heath. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I have a question about a relatively small amount of money on page three of the detailed sheet from the Office of Child Advocate. Um, we've all seen over the last year or two some tragic cases of um, involving children in our state. And I believe a lot of that um, was referred to the, the case management system needing to be upgraded. I'm curious if this small amount of $200,700 was added on to go above and beyond uh, what was allocated in the governor's budget or if the governor's budget just didn't have any funds for this ask. This was a new ask. The governor did not support it. So the $200,000 is a new, they had asked specifically for that amount. Thank you very much. get it, sure. I, go ahead. Yeah, so I'd like to add, just in general, there's a lot of extra in this budget, both from the governor and from us, for, um, for IT, for, for um, uh, adding systems, right, and, and improving, um, improving the use of computerization. And, uh, for example, liquor has a big system that's new, DRA, uh, DAS, and so on. And just in general, we have trouble hiring. So anything we can do with computer systems to improve productivity means in the future we won't have to hire as much, which we're having trouble doing, but we'll be able to rely more than we have been in the past on technology. So this is an example of that. Representative Heath for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for taking my question, Representative. At what point does the, for an individual, does the IND tax kick in? If you're asking uh, specifically, there's a, um, there's a separate, um, uh, there's a limit of, uh, different for a single and for a couple, I don't know specifically, um, maybe what I have in the back of my mind is $2,400. But... Yeah, 2400 for an individual, 4800 for a couple, worth of that particular kind of income, yes. And I think it's, it's doubled for over 65. Does that sound right, Mike? I think there's an extra exemption for over 65 i'm not sure if it's doubled or not though thank you so there is one other thing that um, representative mcguire and i thought might be helpful in the entire division for the rest of you to hear we did a deep dive in the governor's request for a uh, 44.9 million dollar in um, 23 and the uh, $54 million 24 appropriation. It's section 208 um, within the House Bill 2. And everybody said, well, this is a, a sig significant amount of money, but we asked the Department of Administrative Services to come back to us and give us the real dollar amount as far as the benefit cost, those people getting uh, pay raises on other funds, federal funds, and it has a significant increase, which I think you should all be aware of because it was one of the largest items in our review, but it doesn't come to the surface because there was no change. And uh, so in 24 for all funds for this proposed increase, it's $101 million. And then in 25, the uh, all funds for the uh, increase is $123 million. And I, I point that out because it's a significant amount of money, but the division was entirely supportive of that and felt that all our employees should get the 10% and 2% respectively increase uh, moving forward. So again, I just wanted to make you aware of those numbers because it's a little different than what you may be seeing when you go through House Bill 2 in the specific section. Also an indication of how many of our employees are paid not through general funds, but through highway funds or fish and, fish and game funds or other funds or federal funds. So that was kind of overlooked when we first saw the budget because the first pay raise was only shown in general funds. Thank you for That's correct. pointing that out. Representative Emmerich for a question. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I was on Division One, I remember working with the commissioner of uh, the prison. What's it called? Come on. Corrections. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs> And one of the problems then, I'm assuming now, was was the turnover in the guards, because they go, they get trained about 80 percent of the police academy, uh, and so they have a little tiny bit to do. But then they get hired by the towns to go be a police officer. So I suggested to the commissioner that she uses that as a hiring strategy. Join our team for three years, and you'll be a graduate police officer. Uh, so it, reality is they're losing the guards outside. Make it a strategy. This is our intention. And if you happen to stay, great. But what we're hiring you for is to go work for somebody else. A little tongue in cheek, but you n never know. You're absolutely right, Representative Emmerich. It unfortunately has not changed, but the uh, commissioner, Helen Hanks, is doing a very good job. She's put together quite a package with her team about retention to try to get us headed in the right direction. So. They're well aware of and they're, they're working hard to turn it around and that's probably a good suggestion to put out there as well. She does an excellent job. Thank you. I don't see any other red lights. I would hope we could do um, a motion from Representative Leishman and Representative McGuire to accept the proposals we have heard these last hours from Division One, both HB1 and HB2. Any objection to doing them both at once? Seeing none. I'll move that, uh, Chairman Weiler. Thank Representative you. McGuire, second. Second. Clerk will call the roll on the, the uh, Finance Committee acceptance of the report on HB1 and HB2 from Division 1. Excellent report, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Uh, Representative Urf. Yes. Representative McGuire. Yes. Representative Petrie votes yes. Representative Emmerich. Yes. Representative Griffin. Yes. Representative Mooney. Yes. Representative Edwards. Yes. Representative uh, Carol McGuire. Yes. Representative Colfat. Yes. Representative Sweeney. Yes. Representative Cambrus. Yes. Kimbles. Representative Popovici Mower. Yes. Representative Walner. No. Representative Norgren. No. Representative Leishman. Yes. Representative Bucco. No. Representative Hat. I'm sorry. Representative Grassi. No. Representative Hewitt. No. Representative Heath. No. Representative Murray. No. Representative Ebel. Yes. Representative Tolerski. No. Representative Haken Phillips. No. Representative Stringham. No. Representative Weiler. Yes. Mr. Chairman, the vote is 15 to 10 in the affirmative. 15 to 10 in the affirmative. The motion is adopted and we're open for further amendments. Please rest your press your red button if you have an amendment. Representative Hewitt. Sorry. Representative McGuire. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move Amendment 1220H. Um, and I'll speak to my motion if I have a second. All right, we'll return to that when it's distributed. Was it, I need a second. I'll second that.
All right, Mr. Chairman. So um, we had a House bill, House Bill uh, 276 from Representative Rung, that had to do with um, uh, funding, um, creating a new fund to deal with cyanobacteria, um, which is a problem for, for lakes and, um, and other bodies of water, I guess. And uh, so originally, the original bill, House Bill 276, had a very problematic uh, funding mechanism. It, it intended to borrow $25 million and then give it out as, as uh, grants and, and possibly loans. And, and it just wasn't workable as, as it was. And we didn't really have time to deal with it. So previously, we asked this committee to uh, retain the bill, which you did. Now, uh, subsequently, last week, um, Representative Rung came to me and said, could we pass this bill without the money in it? And I said, sure, why not? And, uh, but it turns out that a retain motion is something that cannot be reconsidered. It's one of those few things that once you do it, it's, it, it's done. And so um, this, this amendment would put House Bill 276 into House Bill 2 without the funding mechanism. This is what Representative Rung would like, and um, I think we should support it. And then she has ideas for how this could be changed uh, together with the Senate in the future. So um, that's, that's this uh, amendment. Further discussion? Seeing none. A motion by Representative McGuire, followed or seconded by Representative Petrie, to adopt Amendment 1220H. Does everyone have a copy? Representative McGuire is recognized for further comment. Representative Leishman, whichever you want, you want. I don't know if anybody has any questions, if, if it's at all confusing. Representative Earth has a question. So this talks about setting up a loan fund. Could you just describe how that's funded? Right. So this particular bill simply creates the fund, puts a dollar in it. So so there's no money here, but they have ideas for how they can make changes to this structure to attract federal funds. So, but that's something that's going to be worked out with the Senate. Thank you. Representative Popovici Miller for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking the questions. Um, the language says that those are low interest loans. What is the you know standard of and where does the money to make those loans low interest come from? Yeah, that would be up to DES and how they decide on those particular details. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll on the acceptance of amendment number 1220H. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Earth. Yes. Representative McGuire. Yes. Representative Petrie votes yes. Representative Emmerich. Yes. Representative Griffin. Yes. Representative Mooney. Yes. Representative Edwards. Yes. Representative Carol McGuire. Yes. Representative Colfat. Yes. Alt. Sorry. Representative Sweeney. Yes. Representative Cambrose. Yes. Representative Popovici Muller. Yes. Representative Walner. Yes. Representative Norgren. Yes. Representative Leachman. Yes. Representative Bucco. Yes. Representative Grassi. Yes. Representative Hewitt. Yes. Representative Heath. Yes. Representative Murray. Yes. Representative Ebel. Yes. Representative Talorski. Yes. Representative Haken Phillips. Yes. Representative Stringham. Yes. Representative Weiler. Yes. Mr. Chairman, the vote is 25 to nothing in favor of the motion. The amendment is adopted and added to HB2. Are there any further amendments to be uh, recommended? Seeing none, that was an excellent representation by the team of four from Division One. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Emmerich, are you ready to begin Division Two for a little while? Uh, Mr. Chair. Representative Edwards. What, what, what is uh, your intention about lunch? Uh, do you expect to go all the way through uh, Division Two or take a break halfway through? What, what, what's your concept? I expect to take a, a break around noon and we'll let, we'll let them get started and, and we'll uh, let Representative Emmerich know that uh, we'll, we'll likely stop at some good point when he gets to noon. Th thank you, sir. All right. The Finance Committee will now be attentive to the um, description of the changes made by Division Two of the Finance Committee, recognizing, <coughs> excuse me, Representative Emmerich, Representative Petrie, and Mickey Landrigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to thank the work of the committee and Mickey, particularly, who kept us honest and on track. Uh, so. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start not jumping into the packet necessarily. I, I, there's every now and again, there's something that's quite large and it's like, what just happened? If you turn to the uh, bill packet, uh, page 21, you will find uh, amendment 1105. And I'm gonna do it first because it, it appears all through our, my documentation. And if you don't know what it is, it looks very strange. What this is, is the chairman of uh, finance decided we got to go back to the good old days. And in the good old days, the education trust fund was established because of a court case. It, and it was set up to be funded from various sources uh, over time. That satisfied the court, and so we moved forward with the educational trust fund. In 2011, I believe, when there was a budget crunch, uh, the Educational Trust Fund, which is, w was a fund that could only be used for education and, and did not lapse, so it, it was, had money in it. So what the, the committee did at that time is they took uh, items that had been paid for by general funds and moved them into the Educational Trust Fund. And so as time passed, more items migrated into the Educational Trust Fund because it was getting more and more money. Uh, and the reason it was so well funded is back in the day when it was established, there were probably 220,000 students in the state. And all of these funding sources came in and everything was kind of balanced out. Uh, and it was designed to be just enough or not quite enough so that general funds often were used to make up the balance. Well, over time, as the student population drops, because when I joined finance, I mean, uh, yeah, finance in about nine years ago, I think there were about 220,000 students. Today, there are, numbers are bandied about, about 160,000 or 155,000. However, the contributions to the fund have never changed. So the fund gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and we shuffle more and more things into the fund uh, uh, to try to spend the money down. Well, the chair said enough is enough and put, put forth this amendment, 1105. What 1105 does is it goes back to setting the, the moving a lot of the funding out of the Educational Trust Fund into the general fund. It, what, what it does spe specifically is it modifies contributions from the BPT, the Business Profits Tax, and the Business Enterprise Tax, fixes it at 22.5% each, uh, which what this does in the next biennium is it, it will contribute 
uh, not contribute, it will allocate approximately $222 million in uh, fiscal uh, 24, and in 25, it will allocate about $225 million. So what, what this does is it moves the money out of the educational trust fund in, into the general fund. And I, if you have any questions, we'll ask the chairman. I would like to add further. I was here in 1999 when we created the Education Trust Fund and the Adequacy Formula. We spent a lot of time to, to deciding what would go into the Adequacy Formula, and it was only adequacy. It wasn't special ed. It wasn't building aid. It wasn't um, tuition and transportation. All those items came out of general fund. And so I spent about 20 years on Division II, and it remained as basically adequacy. After some big tax raises, uh, tax increases rather, tax decreases, both by um, federal, by Trump, on uh, bringing business taxes back from overseas, and also the fact that uh, our tax cuts were bringing more, ta more business taxes in. So as, as the chairman noted, the, the shrinkage of the population we were covering for and the increase in business taxes the governor's budget proposed cutting it from business taxes from 50% going to the education trust fund to 35%. When I looked at all the excesses that were coming in education trust fund, I believe we should go back to its historic, for over 20 years, um, use just for the adequacy. So I had um, LBA reduce it to 22%, which brought it closer to just covering adequacy. It, I think it did cover a few more things. If we have to put money in a trust fund and we ends up, end up with a surplus, that's money we could have used somewhere else but are unable to, just as if you, wanted, if you had a surplus in the highway fund, you couldn't use it anywhere else. Same with the fish and game fund. So it remains in that fund. But if we're short somewhere else in general funds, it's because we took money out that we did not need to cover adequacy. So by going back to its roots and its, its mostly 20-year history, that's why I put in that amendment so that the Education Trust Fund would cover what it was always intended and what it historically funded. So that's why I put in that amendment and I thank the Division II for accepting it. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to start with the uh, HB1 uh, items, and I've just got some prepared remarks here. Many of the changes are relative to the budget entry corrections required by the departments. The corrections are detailed on rows 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, and 11. The other changes recommended by the Department of Safety and HB1 were not funded in the governor's budget, but were all part of the department's prioritized needs request. Row 6, in, in the area of E-911 increase for consultants to assist with enhancing network protection from cyber attacks funded with E-911 dedicated revenue. Row 7, three new firefighter instructors for the Fire Academy funded by the Fire Standards and Training and Emergency Medical Services Fund, known as the Fire Fund. Row 8, two new program specialist positions to perform healthcare facility inspections. These positions were abolished in the governor's budget from DHHS and were mistakenly omitted from the fire marshal's office budget. This was the Department of Safety's top request. These are general fund positions. And you're gonna see this again because the positions were coming over from HHS. Row nine, one program assistant position in the fire marshal's office to help with planning, organizing, coordinating division of fire safety, including administrative rules and processing and responding to requests for in information complying with RSA 91A. Requests for 91A have increased over the last few years. In 2020, the department received 132 91A requests. In 2021, they received 159 91A requests, and they are on track to receive 197 in 2022, nearly a 50% increase since 2020. This position would be funded by the fire fund. Row 12, in DMV, provide additional funding to cover credit card processing fees to avoid posting the costs onto customers. An item to do this 
for FY23 was approved by the Fiscal Committee March 24th. This would be an impact on the highway fund as it would come from DMV's cost to collect administer highway fund revenue. Under fish and game, the only change recommended is to establish a senior account accounting technician. This is fish and, game, fish and game funded position. The department has a similar position prior to the shared services initiative from a few years ago. Duties were rolled back to the agency, but the position was not which is why they requested it for this budget. The fish and game budget by division two includes approximately 2.5 million of general fund support. Uh, prior period support was 1.25 million. Part of the reason for that is during COVID, everybody went fishing and they're not fishing so much right now. Under Division II recommendations, the fish and game fund balance out of June 30th, 2025 is expected to be approximately 4.5 million, same as the governor's recommended budget. Department of Transportation. General funds added for the state to provide match to transit agencies to access additional IIJA federal funds. I believe the committee received a letter from uh, uh, Councillor Kenny relative to this with many co-sponsors included. What this is is transportation that is uh, federally uh, that is federally directed, but locally funded, and so then the transportation providers uh, are, are every time they go on a, a transportation for one of these runs, they lose money, and that's this is an attempt to help them with that. Funded both highway, funded both highway funded additional prioritized needs that the department requested division two, row three. Funds provided for the replacement of equipment vehicles. This was the department's full request. This and the next item were the only two DOT highway fund additional prioritized needs. Row four, funds provided for vehicles, telematic devices. Row five, six, and seven, technical budget changes. Row five and seven, entry errors asked to be corrected by the department. Row six, additional uh, apportionments and needed to align with the white Ways and Means Highway Fund revenue estimates. This is the 12% of highway revenue that is distributed to municipalities in the following year. Department of Education, rows 2, 13, 14, and 18, net zero changes. Just move programs from Education Trust Fund to General Fund as part of the HB2 Amendment 1105 that we previously discussed. Row three, increase the tuition and transportation aid to districts relative to career and technical education programs, level supported by uh, the chairman of education. Rows four through 12, all relate to the department's request to update certain positions, labor grades, and starting steps from what was entered into the budget system back in the summer when they expect will be needed, based on what they expect will be needed now. This is a total cost of approximately $1 million general funds and about $190,000 federal funds. Rows 15 and 21, costs associated with the direct HB2 amendment for the department pursue Medicaid direct certification. This includes one new full-time position, contract costs, and additional nutrition reimbursement aid to districts for FY25. Medicaid direct certification would not impact adequacy until 2020, FY 2026. We, cur we currently use uh, the, the uh, uh, Medicaid direct certification for uh, TANF and for SNAP. So this is nothing new. Rows 16 and 17, funds added to cover costs associ uh, associated with episodes of treatment. Uh, this, this relative to HB House Bill 521, which is recommended to be retained. Similar to the court order placements in the footnote, the statutory change in HB2 amendment allows for the DOE to pay full costs from the general fund should they exceed the amounts budgeted. What this is is uh, uh, like it's like a court ordered placement, but it's done by in, for medical reasons. Uh, row 19 change in adequacy funding associated with HB2 uh, Amendment 1170. In total for the biennium, it is 39.3 million over the governor's budget and approximately 158 million more 
over the biennium than current law formula. Row 20, increase reflex HB 20 amendment 1139H, which increases the additional charter school grant to $4,300, which paired with the increase to the base adequacy in amendment uh, 1170, brings the total per pupil base for charters to $9,000. Division two retained representing Mooney's bill HB 272, which had similar intent. Lottery Commission. Division two supported both lottery commission requests. Row 24 added authority to expend to DOIT for the development of centralized CRM solution software system. Division one supported the DOIT budget change for this request. Row 25, budget entry correction. Funds were in the wrong class line in governor's budget. Police Standards and Training Council adds funds to continue the statewide law enforcement accreditations program. It was started in FY23 with ARPA funds and PSTC asked for it to continue with general funds. No federal funds are available. This was PSTC's only request. Community College System of New Hampshire, no change from governor's recommended budget HB1. There are many HB2 uh, Community College System of New Hampshire amendments in the amendment packet, which we will cover. Uni University System of New Hampshire, additional two million from FY25 block appropriation, which will enable UNH to keep in-state tuition frozen through FY2026. And those are my comments for the HB1. Questions from committee members, please press your red button so I can tell you our Getting my attention. Representative Murray, followed by Representative Carol McGuire, then. Is Representative Talerski, you trying to get my attention? You didn't push the button. I did. I shut it off after you oh. recognized Representative Murray. Thank you. Representative Murray. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation. For the people at home who don't have these sheets, uh, would you please, on page four, read line 18 and explain what's going on with line 18? Page four. I'm sorry, page five, line 18 oh. on the long sheet. Sorry about that. My apologies. I thought it was a never, never land. <laughs> well, this is part, this is part of the reshuffling of, uh, this is building aid, which was, was part of the uh, education trust fund and is now moved out into for general funds. Yes. Could you read the numbers for the people at home since they don't have the sheets? Oh, okay. Uh, educational trust fund in FY 2024 is a, a negative eighty-six million nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. In FY 20, uh, 2025 is a negative eighty-seven million one hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars for the biennium total of one seventy-four one eighteen. As I explained earlier, these traditionally for twenty years. We're in general funds rather than education trust funds, so we're restoring to what the historic uh, records were. If you want to see the offsetting entries for that, if you go to page four, uh, row two. Thank you. Who do I have next? Representative Carol McGuire, then Representative Talerski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm curious, on page six, line 30, 33, two million to the UNH to freeze tuition. How many New Hampshire students are at the University of New Hampshire? I have no idea. Thank you. Representative Chalirsky for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. Back to page five, line 18. What jumps out at me here is that special education aid is being moved to the general fund, as well as a number of other things. Does this mean in general terms that money that has 
collected primarily for spending on education is going to be moved to the general fund and potentially can be spent on anything else. It's restoring it to where it was historically there for t over 20 years. I, Special ed money came from general fund. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I just want to clarify so that I'm fully understanding the ramifications of this, that monies that have been earmarked for certain educational costs, such as special education, will no longer be held in the education trust fund, but will be moved to the general fund and potentially those funds could be spent on anything else. They could be. Thank you for clarifying that. Any further questions from the committee? Representative uh, Heath. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I've asked you this question before when we made the major move. Um, just my question is with regard to the education freedom accounts and why, in fact, they were not moved into the general fund. If you would please answer my question, thank you. I don't recall where they were moved. Representative Emmerich? Huh? They're still in the Educational Trust Fund. Because they're part of adequacy. Correct. Right. Further questions from yes. the committee members? Representative Waller would for well, a question. Similar qu question. I'm wondering why court ordered placements for children have been moved into the general fund. That's where they always were, and they were under this. They were under the special ed when it was generally funded. There was no reduction in money spent for education. We are just putting things back where they always had been. This is not any reduction in education. This is not any harm to education. This is putting things back where we always funded them. Is there any further on HB1 from Division 2? Seeing none, this would be a good place to take a lunch break till about 1 o'clock, and then we'll come back to go over HB2 uh, changes from Division 2. Thank you. We're in recess till 1.
the one with House, House Bill 2 from Division 2. Uh, Representative Emery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There was a question before lunch about how many students were at UNH. I have two answers. The university system as, as a whole has approximately 23,000 students. About 50% are in-state, 50% out-of-state. UNH specifically has 15,000 students. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go a little off script again. You have a couple of documents. One is a horizontal document that has some yellow highlighting, and the other has several columns. This is the adequacy program that we were talking about being funded by the Education Trust Fund. So what I'd like to do is just uh, use the, the governor's presentation. He, reserved, he re referred to it as the left side of the equation and the right side of the equation. If you look at this document that has the, the yellow highlights, you'll see three columns, the current law, governor's recommended, and then what was Amendment 1170 provided for. Uh, you will notice the cur current, I'm not gonna talk about current law. What, what you have here in the columns with the, all cities and towns is what your municipality or your school district can expect under the new, under the new formula. So if you want to get what, what the governor called it, uh, spreadsheet wars, is that something like that? Get the spreadsheet war out of the way. Get look it up. You know know what's going on. Uh, basically, what the governor's plan did was it upped the base and the F and R, uh, and so what we looked at was is the governor's plan a good plan? And by and large, the committee felt it was a pretty good plan because they had on what's now the second page, which is the right side of the equation, the governor did have accelerators for uh, communities in greater need. The committee uh, decided after some encouragement that we wanted to step on the accelerator a little faster than the governor as far as increasing the adequacy for needy towns. Uh, and that, that those towns are, have equal, equalized valuation and for F and R. What this does is it puts more money in the, in the needier towns quicker than the governor's plan and at a higher level. We added $20 million per year or $40 million for the biennium. What this does is if you go to the second page and you see extraordinary need grants under the governor's plan the grants were up to six hundred and fifty dollars under what was proposed from division two grants up to three thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars now this is not every student gets three thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars they have to qualify to have a, a equalized valuation under a million dollars. And then it, if you're over six million dollars, you get, don't get any of this at all. And between those two, it, it ratchets down, uh, the, the better off your uh, community is. So we didn't change, we didn't change a lot. The, uh, we did change the uh, 2%, and this was in the governor's plan. We did go to 2% annually instead of 2% by on the biennium. Um, if you want to see the the total the total change in funding uh, on page two, the governor's extraordinary needs grants were eighty nine million and I'm I'm sorry nine million and nine million. I'm having trouble. One of my contacts fell out. <laughs> Well, our, our, our budget goes down because we have higher extraordinary need grants. So the money we spend is $40 million than the governor proposed, but we allocate it much more heavily to towns that really need it. So that's 
that's the adequacy. We did do some also make some uh, changes to SPED and uh, English language learners, just rounding the numbers. That going from 2,079 to 2,100, uh, things like that. Other than that, you know, if somebody has some questions on this, I'll let Mick answer them. Push your red button if you have a question. Representative McGuire, followed by Representative Heath. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the extraordinary need grant of the 3,750, is that on top of the 2,500 on the first page? Yes. Okay. And may I follow up? So do you know roughly how many are in the group on the first page compared to the group on the extraordinary needs grant? I, I don't understand the question. So is there 100,000 students in one group and oh, 10,000 in the other? Or is it how many, how many students, students are involved? For some Ford form of extraordinary needs grant. Yes. Don't know. Don't know. And don't know how many on the first page either. Be in the spreadsheet. No, it doesn't have extraordinary need. Okay. Representative Heath for a question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for taking my question. Um, I think Mickey's probably going to end up um, answering this one, though. Um, we, looking down this list, um, we see um, places like Berlin. Uh, the city of Rochester, um, there are a number of places that really are not seeing um, what we'd hope that they would see with the proposed um, change in the proposal for the funding. Um, I believe that, that with the um, subtraction of stabilization, which I understand has been something that we've been trying to do, but um, what, what do you think we could do in terms of getting some more relief for some of these towns? I, I just am, I have to say, I'm really worried about the fact that many of our towns are kind of getting a double whammy based on the fact that from 2019 through 2023, we used the same kind of data because of COVID. And now we're using real-time data um, as well as a change in the formula. Um, so school districts are not only seeing reductions in their F and R because they didn't fill out the white paper forms that they're supposed to fill out. Um, and and um, again, some of the enrollment numbers are lower than they were a lot of kids are coming back to public schools, but a lot have chosen other options. So school districts ha still have to run their schools. They still have uh, classrooms, the, the same number of classrooms. Uh, they still have to provide transportation. What, uh, what could we do? What else could we have done in terms of um, maybe weaving something else into the formula to, to give our those towns like Berlin um, a little bit extra, and like Rochester? Um, Mickey, I think you're probably going to be the one to answer that. Let me let me give you what, for the first part is the fact that the, the governor's plan and our our plan has hold harmless, so nobody's going to get less than they have the previous biennium. So now you're on. <laughs> so the elimination of the stabilization grant for many communities is not fully made up by the additional aid infused into the extraordinary needs grant. That's essentially why you see many towns held at zero or using that hold harmless to remain at what the fiscal 24 projection was. So the examples that you said, Berlin, Rochester, those would be towns that their stabilization grant that they lost was greater than the amount of additional extraordinary needs, even with the additional 20 million per year added in division two. Follow up. So, um, could we have incorporated um, stabilization um, at, let's say, if we did a quarter a quarter of what it was previously? What would that have done? I, I can't. I, I without being able to run that, I can't tell you specifics. Uh, of course, it would have uh, resulted in less hold harmless being required. Some towns would have still had a stabilization component to their, their adequacy grant. 
but I can't speak to how many more towns would have received additional aid if, for instance, stabilization would remained at 25 percent versus all the way to zero. And don't forget, for many years we've been paying for students who don't exist based upon earlier projections. As the, as the population of students goes down, you can expect the money to go down. So you can't keep paying for students that don't exist. We have done that for several years and several iterations. I don't think we can continue. Thank you. Representative Papavici Muller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to state that we did spend a lot of time in Division Two trying to find ways to achieve those goals. And frankly, to summarize all our, well, to summarize what I learned in that process, I don't want to speak for anybody than myself, but what I learned is that our current system is so fundamentally broken by the many, many patches and band-aids that we applied over the years that the only way to help those, you know, outliers that are not getting the help in here is to put so much money into the system for everybody else that it's beyond the ability that we have to pay for it right now. So we do have to fix this formula, and I think this is the best achievable way to get there while it may not, you know, help every community that we'd like to help, but we are doing the best we can overall, and we try to increase the fairness and address that. So it's just a very tough challenge. Thank you. Representative Stringham, followed by Representative Murray. I was wondering if you could comment at all on uh, why the Extraordinary Needs Grant is based on just free and reduced lunch and not uh, general population. I go to a place like Berlin, there's a four-bedroom house for sale for 57000 Go to a place like Newcastle, there's nothing available uh, for less than seven figures. So, uh, uh, you know, certainly a factor is the, the uh, number of students uh, per, per uh, dollar value of property. Um, and you know, why is the grant just only targeted free and reduced meal when when towns that may not have any students with free and reduced meal or under calculated them may have just as much need well my Take understanding you. and I'll let my LBA uh, pro do it, answer the question my understanding is that the equalized valuation and F and R are both woven into the formula and so like Newcastle you know their their valuation could be five million dollars I'm making it up but I mean So the, the Extraordinary Needs Grant is a current law uh, component to the adequacy formula, and that was not changed in the governor's proposal, nor Division Two, <laughs> with the exception of that max grant. So as far as a component that would be equalized valuation per all pupils, uh, something existed, used to be called fiscal capacity disparity aid, that, was, that did that. Uh, that was repealed a couple years ago, and the Extraordinary Needs Grant was put in its place that that merged free and reduced and equalized valuation into one component. Thank you. Representative Murray for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, and I thank you, I genuinely thank you for all the work. We worked hard on a lot of this, the entire committee worked very hard on this, but um, I feel I have to you know, make a point here. Um, I heard you say that the goal of this was to try to get additional funds to communities that really needed it, the poor communities, that that was one of the things that we considered yes. in putting this together. If I'm looking at this, I don't find any additional fund going to any of the communities that really, really need it. And so can I phrase it like this in rather dangerous terms? Would you agree with me that we did not succeed in reaching the poorer communities? I have to say, I, I, I would hope that we did, but much like Representative Heath, it doesn't look like we did, didn't look like we achieved what we thought we were going to do. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. We did achieve something, but Representative Hacken Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative, for taking my question. Um, I just wanted to draw our attention to the last page of the highlighted um, comparison sheet. Um, specifically in the Hold Harmless Grant section, where I think it's important to acknowledge that the grant amount is reduced by 20% over each of the next five biennia. Uh, and in pointing this out, I'd just like to see if you also will agree with me that 
Um, it is it is true that the folks who do um, receive the benefit of the hold harmless uh, grant in this biennium that we're discussing now uh, will will see a reduction in that hold harmless grant in the next many biennials to come. So the statement that no one is harmed by by this new calculation is in fact not accurate because they will see a reduction in the next biennium. In, in the following biennia. Right. Well, I'm, all, I'm talking about this one. Thank Somebody you. else on the hot seat next biennium can do it. Any further questions from committee members? Seeing none, please continue. Okay. Now we'll get back on script and we'll go to the proposed amendments. A fairly hefty packet. Uh, First item is the uh, Appropriation Community College System of New Hampshire Dual Concurrent Enrollment Program. This is uh, the Running Start Program where high school students can start gaining college credits while they're still in high school. Uh, it was represented as a very successful program uh, and, and quite dynamic around the state. So uh, we, did, we did amend it, but it's still doing very well. Uh, appropriation University system of New Hampshire for the Whittemore Center. Originally, it was, came in at $8 million. Uh, subsequently, the, the chancellor came back and said, well, $6 million would be fine there, and we'll, $2 million will move over to our adult program in the, uni in the university system. So uh, we approved that one. New Hampshire Excellence in Higher Education Endowment Fund, the unique fund. Uh, has uh, no money, so it was deleted. Uh, appropriation for the Department of Education for uh, computer science professional development. This is a, a, a train the trainers program, if you will, where they're going to try to uh, improve the computer skills of the uh, uh, teachers. So uh, they'll get a teacher, uh, get well trained, then go teach other teachers. Uh, we approve that. Department of Education Commission of New Hampshire Civics. Uh, the next two would deal with that. Uh, we didn't really think that the Department of Education really wanted to be in the publishing business. This was actually to publish a book. And so, so we uh, left the commission. We re restructured the commission so that it, has, it includes one parent that has a uh, pupil in public schools. Other than that, uh, we didn't fund this uh, activity beyond setting up a commission, which I know the speaker is going to be very happy about. Um, the next item is the weight permit fees application of receipts. All this did was add over height as another one of the items that can be that they can have a fee for, because up to that point this was for over length, over width, but not over height. So now we can f have a fee for over height. Uh, health and Human Services, uh, I mentioned about this one, uh, the, the res residential care facilities will move to the Department of Safety. Uh, state budget allocation for gross application from highway fund. Uh, I can't even read my own notes. So it was suspension of an allocation. Yeah, nine nine. Right. Yeah, we deleted it. That's right. Um, education freedom accounts eligibility uh, moved in one location to three hundred and fifty percent, and another location is still specified three hundred percent. So what this what this amendment does is normalize three fifty in both locations. Uh, this ed educating trust, trust fund distribution. This is part of the uh, uh, 1105 amendment, where the educational trust fund moved into general funds. Uh, building aid and building grants. There was uh, the governor's uh, budget had a 75 million dollars in, in an item of building aid that became effective June 30th, 2025. Representative Talerski has a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to go back to page 12. 
on the Education Freedom Account Program eligible students. Um, I understand that the change to 350%, is there any other changes to the program that happen in this amendment in terms of who can participate? Well, there's two, there's two bills that pertain to this, 464 and 367. One actually added um, additional criteria uh, and the other one was the, was the one that changed it to the 350. But the one that added additional criteria did not have any specified income. Okay, so when I, I didn't read through this completely yet, having seen this for the first time, but the, the references to foster care migratory child, was there any other um, changes to who actually qualifies regardless of the of the income eligibility? I'm just, no. Say again? Yeah, no. Okay, you thank see, you. You're seeing it all, yeah. Okay, keep the party going. Uh, Department of Education Appropriation CTE Renovation Projects. I think that's another one of the 1105 adjustments. Uh, cost of Spell out the page you're on. Oh, I'm sorry. Page 62. Bill, page 60. Or the, the, the oh, right-hand right -hand column. Side. Okay. I got so many notes here. Right-hand uh, column. Page 14. Okay. Uh, I just went over, uh, page 21, I just went over it. That's the side-by-side -side that we did looking at adequacy. The charter school funding is uh, House Bill 272. Which, that's a good one. Uh, w <laughs> which we ac actually retained and incorporated into the budget. We talked about that as being $9,000 total now. Uh, page 14, uh, the business profit tax. Oh, again, this is 1105 where it goes to 22.5% for uh, BET and uh, BPT. Uh, page 27, Division of Analytics and Resources, a new petition for academic research and improvement for, for data is, a, is an ad. Page 28, Department of Education application for Medic Medicaid direct certification. Uh, as I said, it, when we're talking about HB1, we're currently doing this for the SNAP program and for uh, TANF, so this is a pilot program to see if we can do this for uh, free and reduced lunch analysis or numbers. <coughs> as was said, the the free and reduced lunch forms are not coming back at a great rate because it's been two years to get untrained about submitting these forms. So the FNR is probably gonna be down because of the reduced applications. Uh, page 29 uh, is a subscription to the National Student Clearinghouse Student Tracker Program, which was represented, it will give more information of what happens with our high school seniors and college matriculation and, and we understand beyond. Uh, so this is a subscription. Representative Heath has a question. I just, um, I had asked this in committee too and we didn't um, get an answer. Can, um, I don't know if there's somebody here that knows what data set is used to gain that information. What's the tracking methodology for the, to get the information um, for the clearinghouse? If anybody knows. I, I think it was Greg Hill that said this was successful. He'd heard about it somewhere else. I don't know. He didn't spell out exactly how they got it, but it's, he, he felt it was fairly accurate. Oh, I, love, I like the program. I'm just talking about the data set, how they're doing the match. I'll, I'll check with the Department of Ed. Thank you. Representative Popovici Muller, do you know the answer? My understanding from discussions I was having with the Department of Education, but I would still follow up anyway, is that the data is reported by the various colleges, and basically this is a national program that has a clearinghouse where everybody reports in and they, you know, match it as well as possible and report back to the states in question. But I cannot say that I'm, I can go into the nuts and bolts of the details of the Department of Education with no more. 
Further questions from committee members? Seeing none, please proceed. Okay. Page 30 is an appropriation to Community College System of New Hampshire for workforce credential programs. Uh, this is $2 million, primarily focused on uh, reducing the cost of re-education for adults that are considering professional or life changes. Uh, the promise, the next one, uh, page 31, the promise program is targeted at uh, underprivileged uh, in order to uh, attend the community college system. Page 32, Math Learning Communities Program, Public Secondary Schools. What this is, is, is a, I won't call it remedial math, it is making sure that high school students are proficient enough in math to go to college. Uh, that's what this program is designed to do. And, and we passed this already in, in House Bill 419. A general fund transfer to the highway fund. Uh, when we looked at the highway fund, it was starting to kind of scrape the bottom of the barrel. And so we decided to uh, appropriate $20 million to the, oh no, seven million, 10, I got it. 10 to the highway fund, just cause they were getting very close and, and the snow season wasn't quite over yet. So, and, and in the past, I think last, uh, last, uh, term, the Senate actually put $20 million in the highway fund just to keep it uh, solvent. Uh, and we are, uh, Department of Safety contact system. This is for a, a system that if, if there's people have special needs and there's an emergency, people within the safety department knows who, who those individuals are to provide ad, uh, additional aid. This was also passed in House Bill 560. Uh, the last item is the Department of Safety, uh, uh, the Division of State Police appropriation for a bail uh, sta condition status. What this is, is if somebody gets put, arrested in Hampton and they have to go into and bail, they get bailed out, they get in their car and they drive to Laconia, they get in trouble in Laconia, the Laconia bails person doesn't know that that person's already on bail. So what this does is it basically is a database of who's on bail. Uh, so that if somebody's already on bail, they just violated their bail by doing whatever it is they did to go have to get bail again. So that th this was a, a last minute addition to the, to the mix and it was appropriated for $1 million. This was a request from the chairman of the uh, Criminal Justice Committee he said he had several other bail bills that were kind of dependent upon this information being available. So if we didn't pass this, it made several of his other bail bills not very worthy. Thank you. And that concludes my formal presentation. And I would move the uh, acceptance of HB1, HB2, Division 2. Representative Petrie, do you have a second? I do. Oh. Okay. Representative Petrie, did you bring the uh, list did. with you? I sure did. You're on top of it. Thank you very much. So the motion now is to accept the report of Division 2 for HB1 and HB2. And after we vote on that, we can be entertaining further amendments. So is there any questions before we go to that vote? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be voting to support the work of this division. Although there are things in here that I don't like, I'm not a fan of uh, education freedom accounts, but there are things in here that are good additions to our budget process. And in all good faith, I couldn't vote against this division after the work that was done in my division and the important things that we did. So I will be voting yes to support Representative Emmerich's motion. Further discussion from committee members? Seeing none, are you ready for the question? The clerk will call the roll. The motion is to accept the report of Division 2 for the changes to HB1 and HB2. Clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Earth. Yes. 
Representative McGuire. Yes. Representative Petrie votes yes. Representative Tracy. Yes. Representative Griffin. Yes. Representative Mooney. Yes. Representative Edwards. Yes. Representative Carol McGuire. Yes. Representative Colfall. Yes. Representative Sweeney. Yes. Representative Cambros. Yes. Re Representative Popovici Muller. Yes. Representative Walner. No. Representative Norgren. No. Representative Leishman. Yes. Representative Bucco. <clears throat> no. Representative Grassi. No. Representative Hewitt. No. Representative Heath. No. Representative Murray. No. Representative Ebel. No. Representative Tolerski. No. Representative Haken Phillips. No. Representative Stringham. No. Representative Weiler. Yes. Mr. Chair, the vote is 14 to 11 in the affirmative. Thank you. Are there any amendments being offered from any members? Chairman Weiler, we do have five Division II related amendments, so I can take those up. I, I, the first one that I have here is for Representative McGuire. I'll pass that out here. So I'd like to move Amendment uh, 1078H. Okay, Representative Ma McGuire moves Representative 1078H. It's a one-liner. Is there a second? Weiler seconds. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I should have prepped that better. I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Mr. may I speak to this motion? McGuire is recognized to explain the amendment. Thank you very much. So um, this removes the Whittemore Center um, six million dollar appropriation from which is, uh, I believe, section, well, it was originally section 10 of House Bill 2. I don't know what section it is now, but 10 and 11. Um, everybody has sort of their favorite and least favorite parts of the budget. And this is, for me, my least favorite part. I think um, it's, it's just inappropriate public spending, in my mind. We get our money from from people all over the state, many of them from modest, modest means. We charge uh, a large amount of property tax and so on. So, so everyone com contributes. And in this case, we are taking their money and using it to buy a hockey rink, um, a hockey arena. And to me, that's just completely inappropriate. It's not like much of the other things we spend in the budget where people are children or disabled or sick or elderly and so on, um, or even core functions of government like, like justice and prisons and all that, these are fans and uh, participants in hockey. And it seems to me that this, would, this item must be the easiest thing for the university to raise money on their own, right? I mean, this is be very attractive to uh, fans of hockey, people, they could sell seats, they can sell bricks, they can uh, raise money and so on. So I just think this is, a, this is an inappropriate um, expenditure. Now you might ask, well, okay, if we save six million, since this is the worst part of the budget, Maybe we should add six million to some other part of the budget, right? And, and in my opinion, any other part <laughs> would be an improvement. Um, but in this case, I have not proposed to add this money back into some other section, but instead just to leave it out. And just in general, I think, you know, we don't have to spend every single last dollar. And if we leave a little wiggle room for the Senate, that means that the things that are our priorities, when they add their priorities, they would have to change our priorities less, if you see what I mean. So, so this is just simply a cut, not a, not a balance in some sense. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Heath for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the University of New Hampshire serves our state well. Um, 
we have a workforce that comes directly from them. The Whittemore Center is not only a hockey rink. Um, the purpose behind this is to actually offer essentially seed money that will be doubled and tripled by many private um, donors. But those donors are looking for an understanding that the state of New Hampshire believes in the University of New Hampshire, funds the New University of New Hampshire. This is a small amount of money that we can step forward and there will be other donors who will step forward because we have stepped forward. We have not funded this. I, I'd say in this biennium, we are doing the best we probably have done in a long time. But this is important for the university. And I think it's something that it's time that we use this as a step forward. Now, the Whittemore Center is used for many purposes. Um, it's used by many high school teams uh, when they play, have their playoffs. It's used as an entertainment venue. Um, and it's also um, a venue that can be used to drive more funds for the University of New Hampshire. So I would ask you all to vote no on this amendment and move forward so we can support the University of New Hampshire Whittemore Center. Thank you. Representative Hewitt for a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize I'm machine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, from my memory of the testimony we heard from UNH when we were discussing their budget trimming from the $8 million to the $6 million um, presented, um, and which we're now contemplating deleting that line item, um, the testimony was stated that not only were the you know UNH Division I hockey players um, taking advantage of the ice and the facilities, but also Paralympian and other um, disability-based teams who train in that center as well. So I think, is it correct that the earlier comment that this does not um, help our children across the state who have disabilities incorrect, in fact? That's correct. Representative Edwards for a question followed by Representative Murray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not many people know that I grew up in uh, in Nebraska, and they have a strong football program there, and they spend a lot of money on it because it's a big part of the culture. Uh, the state appropriates no money to the athletic department of the state. It's responsible for uh, supplying all of its own revenue to co cover all of its own costs. And knowing that over the last two decades, there's been a facilities arms race where schools are competing each other with each other ba on the basis of nice facilities. I can appreciate the Whittemore's uh, request to, uh, to upgrade their facility. I would just say that I don't believe that's a state responsibility because that's the way I grew up. Thank you. Representative Murray for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just um, seconding that this is an important public-private enterprise, which I think has great benefit across the state. And to that end, uh, when I've been there, it's not filled with students. It's filled with families who aren't really associated with the university, and it's a fairly expensive in night or night out for everyone to be able to go there. So it's used well, well beyond your sense of, oh, this is a university enterprise, a bunch of university students there. I was really taken aback at the number of families who are there for a pleasant night out. Um, and it is a revenue stream that can be an additional revenue stream. The Republican Convention was held there one year. It was filled. There are lots of opportunities. We talked about the new um, concept, which is really new to me, of e-gaming and having all these sort of competitions. It's not just that they're building this place, but that it enhances a revenue stream that brings in more money to the University of New Hampshire. And also, I think I recall in um, the testimony that the students at the University of New Hampshire, 50% coming from other places and 50% staying here, um, like New Hampshire, intend to stay here. So the university is also providing a venue for workforce where these students come here and they decide they're going to figure out how to stay in New Hampshire. And having I hesitate a little bit to use the word amenity because it goes way beyond that. But having a university that is competing at a national, international level is bringing in fabulous students that we want, that we want to stay here. So I think that this is an investment, 
not necessarily in the University of New Hampshire, although it is. It's an investment in the state. Representative Popovici Muller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's a comment, really. Um, having been the other state rep that visited, I do agree with Representative Murray that uh, the upgrades to the um, infrastructure are needed. They don't actually affect the rink itself. The rink is fine the way it is, but the weight rooms and there are a lot of things underneath where the athletes that compete have less than ideal facilities, which indeed affects recruiting. So I absolutely see the need for UNH to uh, upgrade those facilities, but having been one of the few people who voted against this in my division, it's not that I don't see the need, it's that I don't think that the need is compelling enough for the state to spend money that are kind of desperately needed elsewhere and our unfunded liabilities come to mind that, you know, we, we have to do this. But I want to make it very clear that I fully agree that in order for the sports program to stay competitive, they do need to improve. It's just, you know, not something that I'm comfortable sending general funds, you know, funds to. Thank you. Representative Sweeney. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is this is more of a comment. I want to thank the vice chair of my division, Representative McGuire, for bringing this amendment forward. Uh, I will be voting no on the amendment, though, and I think in this committee, when we're voting no on a, a financial proposal, whether from a division or, or as an amendment, we should explain why we're voting no. So that's what I'm going to attempt to do here. This budget is going to have a lot of pills in it that we all have to swallow. I, I mentioned in division when one, when we were working on our elements of the budget, I think if each of us put together a budget that we would want individually, there'd be 400 budgets in the state of New Hampshire that we'd be considering. I respect and I thank the work of division two that looked at this part of the budget. They worked among themselves in good faith on what they presented to us today, and I support the work that they put forward in. Um, and I look at this, uh, we, can, we can debate the philosophy on whether state funds should be used on this, should not be used on this, but I think it's a piece of the budget package that is going to make it easier for others to swallow different pills in the budget they may not want to swallow. Uh, it's not going to be a budget that I think we can all uh, swallow each individual pill. But as a Morpheus, it's something that we can all get behind. Uh, and if this is something that is going to help others support the overall final package, uh, I'll vote to keep this in the budget by voting against this amendment. But I do hope we're all operating in good faith in that we can get to a budget proposal either by the end of tomorrow or by the end of Wednesday that we can unite behind as a committee because I do think that's important for the people of New Hampshire. Uh, from what I've heard from the other divisions, and I know we had a great time on Division One, putting together our proposal, and, and we heard a, a presentation from Division Two, and I'm eager to hear Division Three. Uh, a lot of work was put into it. I don't want to second guess the work the divisions have put in, uh, and I do want to make sure that we can build a budget together that works for all the different pockets of New Hampshire. Uh, so I appreciate the conversation. The you know, and, and I probably in a separate matter would say, you know, no to the Whittemore Center. I think it's an important piece to get this overall budget passed, and that's why I'll be voting no, uh, hoping that we're all engaging in good faith to, to get a budget finalized that we can all support and swallow the pills with. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just want to make a, a, a point. This is actually coming out of surplus funds. I mean, there's still there's still state funds, but it is surplus, uh, and it is a, a a coordinated effort at the university because the funds that are coming in are from donors, sponsors, UNH itself, and the state. And part I I got a call from a, an alumni from '73 encouraging me to say we really need to know the state is behind the university. So I'll be voting no on the amendment. Representative Edwards for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And th this is a, a question to the uh, amendment sponsor. Um, so I understand that there were um, a lot of tensions at the end of uh, our stay at the Whittemore Center as a legislature, and that there were rumors that uh, we had been kicked out and asked not to return. 
And so would you consider an amendment that would designate the Whittemore Center if we put money into it as the secondary off-site location for the legislature should we ever need it again? And I'm not entirely serious, but I, I, I do think there's a point in there. Uh, thank you for the question, Representative. Fortunately, I was not a member of this uh, body at the time, so I'm, I'm going to defer, defer judgment on that. The CFO has confirmed that for free if, if this passes. Mr. Chair. Representative Griffin. I, I have a question, if I may. Did this come in at, at a larger figure originally, and it's been cut back already? Yes, it came in at $8 million. I probably will be supporting a no vote on this amendment. Any further questions from any of the members? Seeing none, the clerk will call a roll on the motion to adopt amendment 1078H to HB2. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Uruf. Yes. Representative McGuire. Yes. Representative Petrie, vote. I'm sorry. Uh, Representative Petrie votes no. Representative Emmerich. No. Representative Griffin. No. Representative Mooney. Yes. Representative Edwards. Deference to the chair, no. Representative Bean. Uh, I'm sorry. Jeez. Uh, Representative uh, McGuire. McGuire, sorry. Yes. Blame me for that one. That's a yes. Representative uh, Kofalt. Yes. Representative Sweeney. No. Representative Cambrils. Yes. Representative Popovich Muller. Yes. Representative Walner. No. Representative Norgren. No. Representative Leishman. No. Representative Bucco. <clears throat> no. Representative uh, Grassy. No. Representative Hewitt. No. Representative Heath. No. Representative Murray. No. Representative Ebel. No. Representative Tolerski. No. Representative Haken Phillips. No. Representative Stringham. No. Representative Weiler. Yes. Mr. Chairman, the vote is seven yeas, 17 no. Any negative? Motion fails. Next amendment. So, so we have two amendments for Representative Heath, and we'll pass them both out together. Did Mr. Somebody? Mr. Chair. Mr. Somebody? Are we missing someone? Pavici Muller. Are we missing someone? Because this was uh, announced as a 7 to 17. No. Whoops, should have been. Mr. Clerk, are we missing anyone? Yes, we are. I, I was checking on that, and we did. Uh, it's 8. It's 8 it's to 17, which is 25. It is. Eight to seventeen, different number. Okay. Yeah. See, that's. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to um, introduce. I have two amendments, and I'd like to introduce the first one is um, an appropriation. It's uh, Amendment Number One Two Zero Two H. It's appropriation to the Department of Education, Adult Education, the sum of $500,000 um, in the fiscal year ending June 30th, uh, 2023, um, is hereby appropriated to the Department of Education for the purpose of increasing funding available for grants to adult education programs during the biennium ending June 30th, 2025. This appropriation shall not lapse. The governor's... Um, so the purpose of this amendment is a simple one. Um, it's come to my attention that um, 
due to a regional formula change, um, a number of dis school districts' adult education programs have had their funding reduced. Uh, for example, example Dover, um, Nashua, and some other districts as well. And this uh, appropriation of $500,000 to the adult education line would help to um, at least mitigate to some degree that um, change in funding. Um, so I'd appreciate a yes vote on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. How much is already in that line? Um, I think it's about four point three million each year, Thank or four point five million, Mickey. I think. I'd have to look that up. It, it's in approximately four point five, and our adult education programs across our state have done yeoman's work. Um, so many of our our youth who become different disenfranchised with school have gone on. Adults coming to this country from other. Um, nations have been able to get their high school diploma um, or high school students have been able to make up a course through adult education. So it serves many purposes. Representative Edwards for a question. Um, I, I, I assume this is general funds and not coming out of the education trust. <laughs> Good question, Mr. Ed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the um, funds will be coming out of general general funds, yes. Further questions from the committee? Representative Petrie. Yeah, I need a second on that. Representative Murray seconds. Um, Murray? Was it Murray or Grassy? Murray. Oh, okay. Murray. I got Murray down. Representative Chalerski, did you have a question? I just had a comment Go on ahead. the amendment. Um, the director of the Nashua Adult Learning Center reached out to me when they discovered this oversight and how the funding formula had drastically impacted what they were planning on receiving. Um, the amount of services that they provide has really skyrocketed in the last few years. And um, this will be a small correction to try to help them stay on track. Um, they do a phenomenal job in educating uh, new Americans that will help our workforce um, in terms of all kinds of life skills, English language learners. Um, they also have um, some child care services so parents can continue with their education. Um, and I hope everyone could support um, Representative Heath's amendment. Thank you. Representative Popovici Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just I'm trying to remember if this was ever discussed in Division 2, and I'm not sure if this topic came up. I mean, I know we talked about the appropriation as a whole, but I don't remember this formula issue. If you could maybe help me catch up. If I may, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I did not know about this um, is issue in the beginning. When I asked the Commissioner of Education, um, he explained that um, he thought that there were sufficient funds in that line um, because I had wanted to increase that line. And he said, we, we really didn't need to. And then I became, because of the change in the formula and the concerns that have been raised by um, various entities, um, it came to my attention. And I did go and speak with the chair of Division Two, And at that time, that was the day that we made our major move um, in terms of our funding. Thank you to Chair Weiler. Um, so I did not get a chance to really bring it up and do anything. So I asked the chair if he would be comfortable with me doing this today. And he said it would be OK. Follow up? Follow up. Just a quick follow up. Um, did you have the opportunity to reach out to the, you know, the commissioner or the Department of Education to, or was it just, you know, us and the people you already mentioned? Uh, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, on, on Friday during fiscal, the uh, Department of Education was here, and I asked the representative to go back to the department. She couldn't answer the question, so she went back to the Department of Education, and she inquired, and she came back and explained to me that there had been a change in the formula. That's why those communities received a lower allocation. Thank you. Representative Edwards. 
Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for the second comment. I, I just uh, would want to point out that um, in the Division Three budget, there's a section for uh, refugees in which uh, we do pay for uh, education, such as English as a second language. And if we were to spend this money, it might be better to spend it over through DHHS, where there might be some matching money available. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, vote no on this because I'd rather see this money go in to increase the amount that we're going to put into the Medicaid uh, uh, reimbursement rate increase. Representative McGuire. Yes, thank, th yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very curious about the this formula. Do you mean the formula that determines how much each school district gets or what? You know? The department told me it's a regional shift in the formula um, that um, gives out the, I believe, the federal dollars. So, follow up. So, is this who owns this formula and why was it changed? <laughs> I was only told that it was changed by the federal government. Thank you. Representative Dan McGuire, did you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You might expect uh, Representative McGuire asked my questions. Two great minds. Further comment or questions from the committee members? Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll on the motion to accept Amendment 1202H. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Earth. No. Representative McGuire? No. Representative Petrie votes no. Representative Emmerich? No. Representative Griffin? No. Representative Mooney? No. Representative Edwards? No. Representative, uh, yeah. Who's in for being? McGuire. A great mind gives, a lot, gives it up. Let me see. Uh, no. Okay, uh, Representative Kofal. No. Representative Sweeney. Representative Campbells. Rep Representative Popovici Muller. No. Representative Walner. Yes. Representative Norgren. Representative Leishman. Yes. 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 Yes, yes. Yes. Oh. No. Motion fails. Uh, Mr. Chair, I uh, respectfully will decline to come forward with another amendment. Thank you. Any, fur uh, any further motion? So, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, move amendment number 1175H so that I could explain it. Representative Murray moves, Representative Griffin seconds that we adopt amendment 1175H. Representative Murray is recognized. Mooney. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. I appreciate uh, you indulging me here. Uh, amendment number 1175H is an exact replica of a bill I sponsored this term, House Bill 354, which is currently retained in the House Education Committee. I apologize that it looks onerous, but this is simply what this amendment does. Public charter schools are not allowed or permitted to simply apply for school building aid. This does nothing more than allow public charter schools, of which there are approximately 28 in the state, to simply go through the process like any other public school to apply and then have the district vote on the ultimate building aid through a warrant article. It's an onerous process. You may recall when the Department of Education came to testify in front of us about some school building aid items, I asked the question, are public charter schools the only public schools excluded from the ability to apply for school building aid? And the answer was yes. So this bill keeps the school building aid process intact it just simply allows those public charter schools that own their own buildings. So now you're up to about two or three in this state. Only those that own their own buildings would be allowed to apply and go through the process like any other public school in our state. There is no fiscal impact here. My House Bill 354 has no fiscal note. Another thing this amendment does is it corrects currently a glaring contradiction in our law. So glaring, in fact, that when we had the Department of Ed in front of us to talk about appropriating money for a position so that someone could go through all the education statutes and recodify them, they used this example as the reason for the position. This amendment would take out the section in current law that says no charter schools may apply for school building aid, but it keeps the section in law that says they may get up to 30% of the project if they go through the process appropriately and are awarded school building aid. We cannot let a glaring defect like that in our law continue. In fact, to the point that the Department of Ed has had many questions and it caused confusion. So with that description, I would uh, respectfully ask that this committee add this amendment to House Bill 2 in order to put public charter schools one step forward to be on the same footing as traditional schools and correct the glare in the current statute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Leishman first. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for taking my question. Could you tell us why the Education Committee tabled it and didn't move it along? Thank you, Representative. I could give an answer, um, not speaking on behalf of the House Education Committee. However, two things come to mind. First of all, they've retained a host of rather sophisticated school building aid bills. Uh, some of which to change the formula, change the process, change the timeline, change the deadline. And so naturally, it would make sense to retain this as well and include it as part of that bundle. Also, in my introduction of House Bill 354 to the House Education Committee, there was talk about, well, who owns the building if it were to dissolve, what happens in that case? My bill, my amendment, addresses that. And also the Department of Education has provisions about who owns the building in each charter if a school were to close. But it, that's my opinion as to why it was retained, those two issues. I've discussed this with Amy Clark, um, my original bill at the Department of Ed. She oversees school building aid, so um, she and I have had discussions about this. Um, that is my, my thought with regards to your question. But I would, if I could, just remind uh, members that of 28 schools, uh, charter schools in the state approximately, only two or three own their building. And this amendment 
applies only to charter schools that own their own buildings. Thank you. Representative Walner for a question. So tell me how, how a school, a charter school that owned its own building, what would happen if they did, um, they dissolved, the school dissolved, how would you, how would you handle building aid that had been given to that school? Thank you for that question, Representative. I would uh, direct you to the first page of the amendment, lines 613 through 19, uh, with regards to its dissolution being subject to a plan for the disposition of the charter school's assets. And then it quotes an RSA as approved by the State Board of Education. So that clause was designed to specifically address exactly your question. Two years ago, I put forward a similar bill, and this, was, this clause was not included. And so as a result of conversations I've had, and to address the very question you ask, I've inserted that section. Any further questions or comments from the committee members? Representative Edward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You and I haven't talked about this in a long time, so you're going to give me an education, I think, if, if you can remember the conversation. I, I, I had pointed out that I understood the Pinkerton Academy to be in a third category, not a public school, not a chartered school, but some other category. And I had asked uh, if uh, this could be written in a way in which the Pinkerton Academy could also become eligible for school building aid because they are not now. And they serve the kids of uh, three of my towns, Chester, Auburn, and Candia. And so I, I, I'd like to know uh, if my residents might be able to benefit from a, a bill such as this. Okay, thank you for the question. I do recall the conversation. I further recall that when we had somebody from the Department of Education in front of us, you asked that very question, and a follow-up was promised. I don't know if it was given to you. I am unsure that that is a separate, any, the Pinkerton Academy is a separate category from a traditional public school or a charter school. My understanding was Pinkerton Academy is a traditional public school that just draws from multiple communities, is my impression. My recollection is Cole Brown and Pinkerton are public academies. That's the way they're listed, in, as you say, in the third category. They're neither a charter school nor a public school. They're, um, and they get the tuition money that each student brings with them. And they don't, they don't, uh, they don't request any building aid, and they built a great deal. Any further questions or comments from committee members? Representative Heath. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just in relation to um, Cole Brown and and Pinkerton Academy, they are um, public private. Um, they have a board of trustees. They collect tuition from whatever just sending districts go to their school. Pinkerton Academy was eligible for CTE grants, uh, career and technical education. They're a vocational center, and so they were, in fact, eligible for that. They are not eligible for many of the federal programs, but they are a unique category, and they are not considered a charter school. I think I said that. Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll to adopt Amendment 1175H on HB2 from Division 2. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Earth. Representative McGuire. Representative Petrie votes yes. Representative Emmerich. Yes. Representative Griffin. Yes. Representative Mooney. Representative Edwards. Representative uh, Carol McGuire. 
Yes. Representative Colfall. Yes. Representative Sweeney. Yes. Representative Campbells. Yes. Representative Popovich Muller. Yes. Representative Walner. Yes. Representative Norgren. Yes. Representative Leishman. Yes. Representative Bucco. Yes. Representative Grassi. Yes. Representative Hewitt. Yes. Representative Heath. Yes. Representative Murray. Yes. Representative Evil. Yes. Representative Talersky. Yes. Representative Haken Phillips. Yes. Representative Stringham. Yes. Representative Weiler. Yes. Mr. Chair, the vote is 25 to 0 in the affirmative. The amendment is adopted. Is this working okay? Yours is. Yeah, it seems to be. It, 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 it's, it's spotty than about a third of Mr. Chairman, I'll be glad to address this. Representative Emmerich is recognized to introduce Amendment 1185 to HB2. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At our last session, we approved House Bill 572. In that bill, we basically uh, ma made available a, a meal during school day uh, with uh, uh, qualifications 300%, three times uh, poverty level. However, the bill had no ceiling. It was an unlimited warrant to charge the Department of Education. What this, what this amendment does is it puts a ceiling on how much the Department of Education can pay out, basically saying they can't pay out any more than they have budgeted. So this was basically to correct what we might refer to as an oops, uh, very technical term. Uh, and that's what it does. It doesn't change anything to do with 572 except putting a lid on the spending. This bill should have come to us in the regular course of events. The chairman of education said he was so swamped in bills, he didn't get to all of them in time. He had, I think, over 100 bills. So this one was an oversight. We have not put it in, the, in the, any of the um, any parts of the budget. So this is a, a way to find out if the Senate has more money when it gets to them and they want to spend it. This, this will be there, but it'll be at this point unfunded pretty much. But I would move uh, Amendment 1185H. Second. Representative Petrie, did you second? Yes. Okay. Further discussions on this, this Re Representative Hacken Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. I, I'm just wondering, um, I know that under HP2, Division 2 has expanded the eligibility of the education freedom accounts for uh, specifically, I'm looking at page 13 of the packet we looked at earlier today, um, where students who are who qualify for um, free or reduced priced meals are now also they also that eligibility has expanded the EFA program. So I'm wondering how these two bills will interact. If, if my understanding of the expanded eligibility for the EFAs was for a much higher poverty level, but here we're seeing the 300%. I'm just wondering if you've thought through that interaction. I'm just trying to set a, a, a limit on how high it can go. The Senate can address a lot of the details. I, this. This was a let's stop the bleeding before it starts attempt. So it probably needs some more work. It, it doesn't even have a fiscal note because these, these amounts were unknown. So before we could, anybody could place this in a budget, we'd have to know what, what's the amount of money likely to be and you know, what's the real reason for increasing it so much. And especially if this is gonna, also another thing that it might impact 
is all these things that we say, okay, free and reduced meals. You get more money in, in your um, school budget if you have more in free and reduced meals. If this is an attempt to, to increase the population that's getting that stipend, then this would be unaffordable if, if it's used in that same way. So this needs a lot of work, a lot of look. So we put it in there because it passed the House, but it's going to have to go on to the Senate, and they're going to have to make judgment on it. At our point, we, we did not have the money in, in the budget, and we don't have e even a fiscal note that we could make a guess. And also, as I say, the effect on the other distributions under free and reduced. So this is, uh, it passed the House. We got to do something with it. We put it in, but we put this, this line in there subject to available funds. So it's there, but it's not funded at this point. Further questions from committee members? Clerk will call a roll on the uh, amendment 1185H to House Bill 2 to adopt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Earth? Yes. Representative McGuire? Yes. Representative Petrie votes yes. Representative Emmerich? Yes. Representative Griffin? Yes. Representative Mooney? Yes. Representative Edwards? Yes. Representative Carol McGuire? Yes. Representative Kofol? Yes. Representative Sweeney? Yes. Representative Campbell's? Yes. Representative Popovici Muller? Yes. Representative Walner? Yes. Representative Norgren? Yes. Representative Leishman? Yes. Representative Bucco? Yes. Representative Grassi? Yes. Representative Hewitt? Yes. Representative Heath? Yes. Representative Murray? Yes. Representative Ebel? Yes. Representative Tulerski? Yes. Representative Haken Phillips? Yes. Representative Stringham? Yes. Representative Weiler? Yes. Mr. Chair, the vote is 25 to 0 in favor. Motion is adopted. Done? Yep. Oh, my God. Okay. We have adopted uh, Division Two's report, and we have put in some amendments. Anything further from the, the committee members on Division Two's report? Seeing none, we'll take about a five-minute break, and then we'll go to Division Three. We'll see what we can get done today on them. We'll go probably till about 4 o'clock. <clears throat> and we'll have more time on Wednesday morning. Tomorrow we'll be busy with all the bills that we have assigned. We'll be execing. And I hope we get good attendance.
Representative Edwards, when you're ready, Representative Edwards, Representative Mooney, Rep and, uh, and Kevin Ripple will all present Division Three. Uh, th th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, members of the Finance Committee. Uh, just to uh, get you oriented, uh, there are going to be two primary documents I'm going to talk off of. The, pri the first document, the kickoff, is labeled uh, House Finance Division Three, HB1 and HB2 Proposed Amendments. I'll go through the amendments first, and then we'll go th th through the longer sheet that's titled Detail Change, House Finance versus Governor Division Three, Category 5, because by the time we get through the amendments, we'll have talked pretty much about everything that's in the other sheet um, as a summary. Um, first, I'd like to just point out uh, how great I think that the, the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the Veterans Home, has uh, responded to our need for information uh, the the uh, thoroughness of what they've provided us, the collegiality in which it's been offered. I want to thank uh, Commissioner Weaver for that, and uh, Mr. Nathan White, and uh, and really all of the uh, division directors that spent all kinds of time with us. And of course, uh, none of that would have been coordinated uh, on behalf of the the division and the and the committee without uh, Mr. Kevin Ripple, and I, I, maybe Mr. Kane had a little bit to do with it. I wouldn't give him too much credit, but uh, I'd really say uh, Mr. Ripple uh, has just been absolutely amazing. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to give you sort of uh, what I, I would consider uh, the strategic imperative of what Division Three was looking at this time around. Uh, we were looking at, um, uh, a, 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 an HB 17 from Ways and Means that had a smaller amount of money in it than what the governor spent. Um, there's uh, talk of, uh, of a recession, and uh, thankfully we have a nice rainy day fund to you know, kind of uh, protect some of the worst concerns from that. Um, but, but, then we, but then we also uh, recognize that within the state, uh, our, our, one of our biggest challenges, kind of uh, the unavoidable thing in our in front of us, is that the emergency room boarding situation uh, is just unacceptable, uh, and uh, it's essential that we take whatever limited resources we have. We have limited resources, and we have unlimited wants, and that's kind of the first rule of economics, regardless of where you go. So we had to take our limited resources to, and to apply them in a way in which, you know, I think we um, have leveraged them fairly well. In the, in the governor's budget, um, what he proposed was a 3.1% across the board Medicaid fix. And I'm not, I'm not talking yet even to an amendment. I'm just doing an overview. What, what he talked about was a 3.1% across the board Medicaid rate increase. And 3.1%, um, if you take a look at the ER boarding um, situation, uh, which is, I think, in a crisis, almost third worldly, um, we uh, uh, really needed to address that, and the 3.1% wasn't going to get us there. In his verbiage, the governor told us that if we wanted to try to target Medicaid reimbursement rates, that, that we were encouraged to do so. So in the five or six months that the, that the executive branch put together their budget, they did not provide us or offer us a, a methodology to do the Medicaid, med, Medicaid reimbursement uh, targeted rate increases. So, um, so I'll talk some more about that later, but I just wanted to tee up the idea that given that we were already spending more than the governor, or, uh, well, well, that we had less money than what the governor had available to us, and that we had this um, major uh, strategic imperative that the governor hadn't funded, we were looking for bill payers. We were looking for ways to save some money. And, uh, and particularly when we know that we've got these raises that aren't in HB1, the 10% and the 2% uh, respectively in the two years. Um, so, so with that, I, I offer kind of as a first example, um, uh, um, amendment 
1196 Hotel, that's on page three. Uh, this is a uh, often referred to as a, a back of the budget cut, uh, and it's identical to what's in the current year or the current budget. The uh, it 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 basically says that they are once they get the their entire budget, they have to reduce it by 30.4 million um, by the end of the uh, uh, biennium. I want to take that money. I want to put that uh, towards Medicaid reimbursement rates, and and given that inflation is so strong, there was some discussion about increasing this 23.4 million to an inflation-adjusted number. We chose not to do that. We didn't want to put the extra pressure on the department. They they handled this this current budget year. They can handle it next time, I believe. And then we kept the number of per, uh, permanent. Um, uh, full-time employees at 3,000. They, 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 they are authorized something in the neighborhood of uh, 3224, somewhere in there, um, and, and this imposes a, a, a ceiling of 3,000. And if I've done the math right, they've got about a 19% vacancy rate, which means they probably have a, at least 500 positions they could fill before hitting that 3,000. So I think the practical effect of the 3,000 is probably uh, not particularly bad given the, uh, the workforce shortages. So, so I, I'm, I'm spending so much time on 1196 because it sets a critical cornerstone to understanding the Division Three strategy. Uh, I, we're not taking questions, are we, at this point, or are we? Why not? I I don't see one, but my I have one over here. Okay, Representative Leishman from Walner. Thank you. Um, speaking about the bu uh, budget reduction in the back of the uh, budget, this originally came. the The first one we saw was a reduction in staffing, I believe. This one is just a twenty three million dollar. Um, reduction of the of the um, budget by of the general fund budget. Don't we risk when we do that? Don't we also risk losing federal funds because so much of the department budget is matched with federal funds, so that twenty three can easily become forty million dollar loss. Uh, thank you for the question. This is the same debate that we had as we uh, formalized the current budget that we're in. Uh, rather than ex expand and extend this, we decided to relent and hold fast with where we were. These are funds that the department can choose to uh, uh, save during the course of a two-year period. Um, being smart, enlightened managers, I would expect that they would uh, take a look at how they could reduce general funding in a way to minimize or mitigate any risk of federal uh, a loss of federal revenue. And again, because some of these uh, monies that we budget are due to personnel anticipated that will never hire, there's probably already some room built in there to where we weren't going to spend the money anyways. Isn't it, isn't it true, though, that the Department of Health and Human Services, like every other department of, in the state, will also have a, a lapse amount that will be um, expected of them? The governor will allocate those, those lapses and require the departments to lapse them. So the Department of Health and Human Services will be looking at a $23 million um, reduction through this amendment plus whatever they are allocated through the lapse process. Um, to the extent that you have a point, I would say it's probably a, a fair and good one, um, but it's not within the pur purview of Division Three. Division Three is uh, putting this back of the budget uh, proposal together, and any lapse might come from somebody else. It may come from the total finance committee. It might come from the governor, but I don't have any control or, or authority over that. So, so again, uh, this is exactly what was in the current budget that they're living within, and uh, and and 
based on the testimony, it seems like they're doing okay. Representative McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm very confused. You say that you want them to have a back of the budget cut of 23 million. If I'm reading your spreadsheet correctly, their total general fund budget is 33 million. And that seems, no. seems like I'm missing something. Yeah, no, it, 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 they, 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 our general funds are uh, in like a billion. So I'll, I'll let uh, Mr. Ripples speak to the specific number. Yes, uh, I'd, I'd have to look up the general fund figure in the budget, but the figures on the spreadsheet reflect the changes made by Division Three, not the total budget. Thank you. So, follow up. Follow up. Yes, please. So, is this a twenty percent cut, a two percent cut? It, uh, he's going to find the exact number, but let's say it's a billion dollars. Twenty-three million is two point three percent. Thank you very much. And this is 2.3% 2, 2 over the two years, so it might actually be, you know, one point something and, and done you. in a I way in which they can plan and anticipate and manage their priorities. Thank you. I understand. Yeah, thank you for the question. Horizontal sheet shows two billion, uh, 200 million for the, uh, for the biennium. So in the governor's recommended budget, the general funds appropriations are slightly over a billion dollars per year. Uh, uh, one per one percent and change because this 23 million is over the two years and it's over a billion a year uh, appropriated. So we're talking about one percent and loose change. And, and you j just would hope that we had management competence to handle a 1% uh, haircut. Further questions or comments? Representative Hack and Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm just trying to think, um, and I can't pinpoint it. So I'm wondering, Representative, are there any other departments in our budget plans that are also required to make these cuts and caps? As I said before you got here, and in the current budget, this is word for word what we're doing in the current budget. So I'd say there's definitely precedent for this. Uh, this precedent, as I understand, goes back uh, to a, a prior chairman. I won't, you know, from where. Um, so th this is not newly invented. Um, are you just speaking to the Department of Health and Human Services, or are you speaking to every department? I'm only uh, authorized to, at this point to talk about Division Three, which is the Department of Health and Human Services, plus veterans, uh, the veterans' uh, home, which is not included in the, uh, this amendment. Representative Irv, for a question. Just a comment uh, related to what the chairman was saying. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services has known very large over budgeting areas and. One of the ones he mentioned was the staffing. Um, the, the, the huge vacancies, some of which, and I don't, these not specifically related even to COVID or the current issue with staffing in general. A lot of these vacancies go back to 2018. So it is a different department from the others um, in the state. Uh, and there's just huge dollars um, that are being um, allocated to it. Uh, thank you for contributing that. Um, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, also, I would point out that, that anything we save, we're, we're trying to put into the Medicaid reimbursement rate increase, which is intended to solve the number one critical problem facing our health care system right now, which is the ER boarding crisis. So, you, you know, I, I had asked the executive branch for bill payers and, and not seeing any in the proposed budget, uh, this is a way to find 23 million that we can invest in our patient care. Representative Stringham for a question. Uh, thank you for taking uh, my question. Um, is it true that um, you know some, some areas, for example, the de developmentally disabled uh, budget that wouldn't be able to be touched by this amendment while the most likely place would be payroll, where there's a lot of uh, 
a vacancy right now with a high likelihood of not being filled. Uh, so, um, if, if it, and if it was entirely from payroll, we'd be looking at uh, seven to eight percent out of this 19 percent current vacancy uh, being factored out. That would have been a good Division Three uh, conversation to have. Um, I, I don't recall having that conversation. I would have asked uh, the uh, department to prepare a more detailed laydown of how the existing back of the budget cut that they're already dealing with, where those dollars came from specifically. But I didn't anticipate the question. I my, I apologize. I, I do think last year that the um, or last biennium, um, the the uh, uh, the back of the budget was targeting payroll entirely. While this time, um, the department is being given more flexibility, uh, if there is anything in contracts or otherwise that could be um, uh, or would not be uh, used, that um, uh, they could be taken um, taken to account for this as well. So, you know, thank you for your comment, and I do recall that we did amend this. It's not exactly what the current uh, back of the budget is, because you're you're right. We did put some more flexibility in here. I don't remember the word usage we did exactly, but the intent was to uh, to take some of the pain and pressure off the department by making it more flexible to get to the number. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next question from Representative McGuire, followed by Representative Grassi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Twice you've used the phrase ER boarding. What is that? All right, so I, it, it's been in the news a lot, and I, I, I apologize for assuming folks may know what it is. I should have explained it better, but we, we have um, some number of emergency rooms within uh, the state of New Hampshire. I, I'm gonna say 26, that's plus or minus a few, I think. Um, and each in each of those, facilities, if somebody is brought to uh, their emergency room that's in need of, of um, significant uh, mental health or behavioral health care, if they're perceived to be a danger to themselves or to others, uh, then uh, it's only appropriate for that emergency room to discharge that patient into an appropriate health care setting that can meet their, their mental or behavioral health needs. Um, we have a critical shortage in beds to receive all of those patients. And since the patients are coming in at a rate in which it exceeds the ability to discharge them, you build this backup in the emergency rooms. And what that backup does is since the uh, uh, hospitals are not actually treating the patients within their care requirements, they cannot get reimbursed. So they are absorbing all of the costs associated with maintaining that patient in a minimal bed environment in which it's essentially you're keeping them safe uh, and you're feeding them and, and that sort of thing. But they aren't getting care. They're simply being boarded. I, I have callously used the word, the term, ER warehousing, because I, I just find it outrageous that New Hampshire finds itself in a situation in which these patients are being stacked up in the emergency rooms without anywhere to go. And so as we took a look at the Medicaid reimbursement rate hike opportunities, my first priority in that was to build capacity on the uh, discharge or on the, uh, well, from the hospital, it looks like the discharge side, but from the community, it looks like, a, you know, bringing them into the community care si situation. So, um, so you'll, we'll talk more about that later, but, you know, that's, that's sort of a nutshell of what the ER boarding uh, issue is. is. Does that answer your question? Representative Grassi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I noticed you said that this back of the budget cut that you're looking at was something that we've done previously, so it's not something that's unusual. But I'll tell you, one of the biggest complaints I have from constituents is the lack of uh, the waiting time uh, to get services or with agencies um, 
support agencies in our communities that uh, have extraordinary extraordinary problems getting services back from from DHHS, and that you know that, that there's just the complaint they always hear is there's just not enough staffing. And I'm wondering if a cut like this could be making the situation worse. By you say they can't fill positions. Well, are they holding positions open to meet this this cut? And not filling the positions that they probably should be positions that sh they should probably f should be filling in order to provide adequate services to our citizens and and the agencies that serve our citizens. I, I don't think they are is the short answer. And to get, provide a little bit more background, as you know, we have a workforce shortage uh, across the state and pretty much every area, and specifically within the healthcare provider community, and um, and so. We're all chasing the same scarce personnel resources. Uh, so, do I do I think this uh, imposition of the three thousand on the headcount is contributing to the inability of DHHS to perform its mission? I would say that the primary challenges they have from a personnel perspective are really driven by the workforce shortage throughout the state. And to the extent that if I were able to pick and choose where people would go work, I would tend to want to prioritize the direct care provision. In DHHS, they don't actually do direct health care. And so where I'm seeing the crisis overall is in the communities that need to be able to receive the patients and provide hands-on or you know, otherwise therapeutic care to them. And having that employee in the community rather than in Concord in an office building, between the two, I would have my priority being out in the community treating patients. Uh, just just a, a point on this is that a lot of times the problem of being able to provide that service in the community is they're not getting their reimbursements or they're not getting the necessary paperwork from DHHS. I know that if you take a look at some of the situations that are going on in child care, I mean, it takes forever to get certification sometimes for people. And a lot of times it's paperwork through DHHS before you can even hire somebody or you can get somebody or, or you can take a new person on into your program if you can't get the paperwork taken care of. Okay, so, so you brought up two issues. One, you started talking about reimbursements, that the reimbursements are too low. And so that's why I'm taking whatever money we can find from the bill payers to help increase the, uh, the reimbursement rates later. We haven't gotten to that part of the conversation. The theory is if we can increase the reimbursements, we can increase the capacity, we can Im increase the uh, ability to move patients through the system. So care should get better. To the extent that there's an eligibility issue, we're, we've, in, we've got money in here invested in continuing to uh, upgrade and improve the new height system, which is uh, the kind of the universal eligibility checking system. Meanwhile, we're spending something like uh, $20.5 million a year in operations and maintenance for the uh, Medicaid management information system. So we're investing so much money in IT, we're, we're I'm rationalizing and hoping uh, that the, the department is right, is if we invest in the IT, we can get that efficiency, we can get that productivity out of the existing workforce. So we're, we're in a, there is no one answer to this. We're, we have attempted to solve multiple problems and we're trying to keep a balanced approach to do the best overall we can with uh, limited resources and basically unlimited wants. Further from committee members? Seeing none, please proceed. Okay, page two. <laughs> That's a little joke. Uh, no, but uh, literally uh, it's now page four. So, uh, so this is um, a, a deletion on a peer-to-peer -peer grief support programming. Uh, in this, uh, the division voted in a very narrow uh, way to uh, eliminate this. Uh, it's, it's basically using FY23 money on the order of, uh, of 1.5 million. And, and this gave us an opportunity to uh, provide back to the finance committee 
a total of, uh, this is just 1.5 million, a very small piece of the 12.5 million that we estimated uh, we would not need from the FY23 money, making it available elsewhere. On page five, um, this is um, put in because uh, when the budget was being put together, there was no uh, known uh, end state on how the Sununu Replacement Center would uh, be brought together. And so uh, this amendment is, is basically a, a vestigial organ to that. And until um, we get HB 49 through the system, it, 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 I consider it still to be necessary because it's directing that all federal funds or all funds available that are federal and discretionary should be used to uh, pay for the replacement system. Um, then on page six, uh, we have a couple of items that that sort of are in this in the, in the same vein. Uh, over the last many years, a couple of things have happened simultaneously that we've tried to. Uh, to deconflict and clear up so that our books are more open, our behaviors are more transparent. They're both kind of related to the Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Other Drugs. Uh, when that uh, uh, program was instituted, uh, uh, a group of, uh, a large group of stakeholders from around the state were put together to take a look at uh, the, um, uh, the damage done by alcohol and other drugs and try to figure out what we can do to prevent it and to treat it and to follow up. And so uh, in order to fund that effort outside of the budget and to leave it to the stakeholders' expertise and their budgeting process, uh, we, there was a commitment to have 5% of uh, the money that we spend through uh, our liquor stores uh, transferred over to the, this commission. We've not been keeping that 5% promise. So, uh, so elsewhere, uh, we're keeping that promise, but what this specific amendment does is it uh, takes uh, about $2.05 million dollars that would have set a very bad precedent in my view. This was the first time that the commission would have started to use general funds. We, 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 we don't want to simultaneously give them the 5% of the liquor money and then also be adding general funds. We should just do one or the other. And in this case, giving them their 5%, which is a several year old promise, and then not doing some of these things that the governor wanted to, uh, wanted to do. Um, he wanted, in this specific case, um, to uh, manage, to administer, administer uh, the Recovery Friendly Workplace Initiative. So it's not that I, we're opposed to, the, uh, to that program, but uh, funding it with general funds through the commission, through to the program, is a shell game that we shouldn't be playing. So the, the uh, division uh, deleted this. On page seven, this is, uh, this is a similar conversation. Uh, the, you know, whether the program is the right program or not, got caught up in, uh, in being part of a, a shell game that went through the governor's commission on alcohol and dr other drugs where we're funding it with general funds and then we're telling them that they have to go fund the program that we want to. That violates the independence of that uh, prestigious stakeholder community and their budgeting process. So, so this deletion uh, on this is not meant to disparage the program, but to ensure that we behave in an honest and transparent way, consistent with uh, our past promises. On page eight, um, this uh, has been in several budget trailer bills. Uh, it basically says that the department has the flexibility to uh, to fill unfunded positions as long as it doesn't exceed the amount of money that we appropriated for uh, the, that workforce. And in an effort to clean up HB2, instead of having this thing pop up every two years, uh, this amendment makes it permanent. On page nine, um, 
this this was an appropriation for the Sunu Youth Center. It started at about $11 million, but because uh, there was uncertainty during the governor's phase on what would happen, they had put it in HB2, and we directed to have that uh, operating money put instead of an HB2 into HB1. So when we go look at HB1 later, you'll see the money for that. Uh, there's and and there will be a little bit of discussion about that uh, later. Then on page ten and eleven, um, this is for a new program that uh, the state has not officially started, and to the extent that the private sector has started it, it, it came from a request of the hospital association and the nurses association. The nurses association, by the way, agrees with this amendment, supports this amendment. Uh, and and what, what happened was uh, in an effort to establish a healthcare facility workplace violence prevention program, we uh, looked at that bill um, last year, God, it feels like two years ago, but we look, I think we looked at it last year. There was no fiscal note even though we imposed new work requirements and the most onerous was on the rulemaking uh, requirements of, of, uh, of the Department of Health and Human Services, but there were other ones as well. Um, no fiscal note, and then for some reason, even though we passed the law, this just failed to find its way into the governor's budget. So the, the, the commissioner has asked that, um, that we suspend the whole program. We don't want to suspend the whole program. We don't have to suspend the whole program. What, what this amendment does is it, it uh, suspends the state's obligations on the program, but uh, encourages and allows the, uh, the private sector to go forward by establishing their commission to look at uh, healthcare workplace violence and to identify trends. They have a lot of work to stand that commission up. Uh, that legislation uh, basically gives them the framework un under which to do it. Um, it's a vital program, I think, um, but it just we're just going to suspend the state mandates. Now, now, if the state, like the Department of Health and Human Services primarily, but also the AG and Labor, if they find that they have the bandwidth, the manpower to participate in the program, they can certainly do that. The, this amendment allows them to do that. So, so this, is, this was an attempt to find a way to say yes without uh, suspending the whole program but still allowing it to go forward. Item 12 is, is probably the most commonsensical amendment of all. All this does is uh, it deletes a section saying you can't admit people into the forensic psychiatric hospital until the forensic psychiatric hospital is built. Okay, so we deleted that because it was the blinding flash of the obvious that you can't do it anyway, so why put it into law? On, on uh, page 13, uh, we took some um, carry forward funds uh, aimed at supporting the, development, uh, the developmental services fund, the acquired brain disorder services fund, and the in-home support waivers. We, we kept that fully funded, but instead, we pulled FY23 money forward uh, to cover those expenses, and you'll see that later when we get into um, the HB1 item. On, it's on page 3, but it, it, this, this language is needed to enable HB1. The next one is page 14. Um, this, at first blush, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to somebody who hasn't been focused on this for a while. This this is sort of the financial math related to something called the county cap. The county cap is uh, is a a process and procedure under which the state and the county nursing homes had long ago agreed on how to split some costs. What the, our attempt to do in the county cap is to keep the uh, county's contribution uh, towards keeping that agreement in the 2% range. Last year was exactly 2%. Uh, this year, or in this budget, we are 
continuing the exact same amount of money, so it's not going to be exactly 2% because of inflation and stuff. But it's in that very same ballpark. We didn't want to make any radical changes uh, there. Um, this is a really great program. If you go and you talk to your county CFOs of the nursing homes and you talk about the county cap, this provision directly saves our residents uh, property tax money. In Rockingham County, last budget I was told it saved them seven percentage points across the whole property, uh, the county's share of the property tax. So that's a pretty good one, I think. I one moment, a question? Um, Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just a quick clarification. I thought I heard you say that this should increase in slight amounts with inflation, but I look at it and the amounts for the year 23, 24, and 25 are the same. I misunderstood something being said. Could you clarify? Well, I, I think I said it, but I probably didn't say it very well. I, I, I pointed out, just as you observed, that uh, the, the next budget keeps the dollar amounts the same as the second year of the current budget so right. there's no increased money so that was the uh, practice and, and initially when we uh, figured out how much money to put we used the two percent number but because this is a second budget and the money hasn't moved it's it's really not the two percent anymore but thank it's you close. for clarifying much appreciated yeah, no problem i'm sure i could have been more clear okay we're on 15. Okay, so 15 is the, is, uh, you know, back to your point, uh, uh, Re Representative Grassi, you know, how, how can we be more efficient? How can we be more productive? Well, uh, what the, the department believes is part of the answer to that is to continuing to, uh, to uh, maintain and operate and upgrade the, the Medicaid management information system. Now, this item initially found its way in HB2, uh, and so that, that really wasn't the right place to put it because uh, the dollar num amount was so big that I had assumed in the previous budget that this was one-time upgrade money and not an ongoing annual operations cost. And I was the fool last budget that said, don't take this one time upgrade money and put it into HB1, put it into HB2. And so they did what I asked. And this year, when I was looking at it and talking more about it, it became clear that this is just an incredibly expensive operations and maintenance and it belongs into HB1. So, so we moved it from HB2 to HB1. And in order to fund it, we use some FY23 carryover money. And you'll see the detail on that uh, on uh, page one, row nine and 10 of the bigger, longer sheet. Um, so now we're gonna go to page 16. Uh, this is uh, another, to your, your point, uh, of how do we gain the productivity uh, at, at DHHS. Uh, we're, the New Heights system is the name of the integrated eligibility system. And so this is uh, an audit uh, of that system um, to you know make sure that it's complying with our requirements. I hope they're also looking at uh, the workflow to make sure that it's efficient. But anyways, it's at least a compliance audit. We moved it, moved this money instead of being FY23 carryover, we just funded it in FY24. Then we're on page 17. Uh, I would uh, like to uh, uh, give, um, uh, am I, is this the one I'm supposed to do that on? Let me think for just a second. No, not yet. Uh, this, this was, um, okay, there's something called maintenance of effort. Maintenance of effort is sort of, uh, if you're playing poker, it's kind of your minimum ante or your minimum bid to even get into the game. With the feds, in order to get their federal money, we have to meet a maintenance of effort level. Um, and if you take a look at the programs where we have uh, active uh, expenses associated with it, if you take all the general funds that we're planning to spend in HB1 on, on the TANF, uh, towards the TANF, we're, there's still a gap to our minimum level of effort. And so HB2 housed 
an extra $3 million a year so that we could make our minimum level of effort. And, and what that did for us is it bought us insurance so that next time they calculate TANF, they don't penalize us and we get all the federal money that we're eligible for. So looking at that $3 million a year, we went back knowing that this the estimate was six, seven, eight months old and asked the department, and this is an example of Mr. White stepping up for us, we asked them to do a new analysis to see if the $3 million a year was still the best estimate. And he came back uh, and said that the department uh, could uh, uh, be comfortable with a $2.5 million a year amount. So that, that ended up freeing a uh, million dollars over the, um, uh, the biennium. Uh, and you'll only see this into HB2, but so that saves a little bit of money. Now, Mr. Chairman, Representative McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When you add money to an area like this, does it somehow change the eligibility requirements so so more people get money, or or the amount of money they receive gets up a little higher? How does how does this money get spent so that we meet the maintenance of effort? This, this amendment does not change the reimbursement rates for the TANF eligible program, but it does make money available if there's greater levels of utilization. May I follow up? So, so if, if there wasn't the demand for this, would we, would we not meet maintenance of effort or do you see what I mean? Yes. The answer to that is this is the guarantee that we're going to make the minimum payments necessary to achieve the minimum, uh, the maintenance of effort. Because failing to meet the, min the maintenance of effort levels causes substantial enough penalties and a reduction in next budget's uh, TANF funding that we don't want that negative event to happen. So this is, this is extra money. It's sort of like an insurance policy. Do you, do you want to add more to that, Mr. Let me, Ripple? Let me, let me speak to that. Um, basically, if the need wasn't there, we wouldn't need the money. The need is there. This is just to make sure that we have the money in general funds just in case we need more general funds to match what we're bringing down. So the need is there. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't care about the federal dollars. <laughs> this is welfare. This is the temporary assistance to needy families. It, it, and in a bit, we're going to... I, I affectionately refer to them as the uh, the Representative uh, Walner amendments where we spend more TANF money. So she's helping us spend all the money we can put into the TANF funds. So, But we all agreed. Okay, so page 18. Are there other questions? No. Page 18. Uh, this was a deletion of the Family Resource Center funding of $1 million a year. It wasn't that this is not a good program. It, I wasn't clear that there were uh, adequate metrics to measure exactly what these guys were going to do for that extra million dollars a year. So we scraped it and we put the $2 million over the biennium towards Medicaid uh, reimbursement rates. Pages... 19 through 21. Okay, so this is actually where I think um, the department did some really good work together with, in Division III. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of people contributed to it. Now, now, I think it's really good work. Another point of view is it's not very good work because we didn't put enough money into it. But so other than the dollar amount, we did some good work. What, 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 what we did was uh, we listened to the governor, we listened to the community, and we were told that we ought to increase the Medicaid reimbursement rates, uh, and uh, we agreed with them. We needed to do that above the 3.1% that the governor had requested. Um, and so then the question is, if you're gonna increase the rates, which rates are you gonna increase and by how much? This amendment uh, answers that question. Uh, if you look at it, just the major sections of it are in, on between lines five through 14, that 12 million a year that you see there keeps the governor's promise to give 3.1% across the board to everyone. One of the things that was surprising to me was when the hospital association stepped forward and said, 
don't give us our share of the 3.1%. That was $5 million a year. Had we kept that 3.1% promise to the hospitals, instead of $12 million a year, this would have been $17 million a year. What that did was that freed up that $10 million plus the other um, funds that we were getting from um, uh, saving some money on some other programs to spend across the board, across all the Medicaid uh, uh, service providers. And we did that based on the work of the community. They came to us with a spreadsheet of all the services and said, in order for us to basically stay in business for the next couple of years, we really have to have sort of this minimum amount of rate increase to help us get through the next two years. So uh, again, unlimited wants and limited resources. We, we didn't have all the resources to fully fund the community request, but we used their, their format and we used uh, some of the information we got from them so that we could allocate what we could, where we could, with the priority of solving the uh, ER boarding um, discharge issue. So I think this is good work um, because it, it establishes a, a framework that had never existed that the executive Question. branch did. I, uh, yeah, I will. Uh, but it, it, it established a framework on exactly uh, a, a methodology to uh, allow the Senate, if they have a different amount of money to invest, they get, this gives them a roadmap on how to do that in a way that really is, will address the community needs. I, thanks. That was the point I wanted to make. Representative Heath. Thank you. And that was a point I needed to hear as well. <laughs> um, at the public hearing, this is the area that we heard loud and clear yep. from so many. Um, out in my community, I hear it all the time. I hear it at the automatic meetings that we have. Now, what you're defining for us, um, this approach that you're taking will mitigate, to some extent, the need to raise the Medicaid rates, but not to the extent to which you'd like to. So what you what I think I'm hearing is that you're saying that you believe you cre you've you created a path to the Senate so that the Senate then can pick up and if they have additional funds can further the work that you've started. Is that what I heard? I, I, I think you, you could have heard it that way. I, I would say it slightly differently that it is a, is, it's an establishment of a framework that can be used by the Senate. If they have less money, they can use this methodology to figure out where to pull money out. If they have more money, they can use the same framework to put money in. It's a kind of a bi-directional framework, if you would. Now, to give you some order of magnitude on what the blue team and the red team were thinking, this money is uh, um, it's it's 24 million for the two years for the 3.1 percent minus the hospital request, uh, plus 70.2 million dollars added that the governor did not. So we added 70.2 million dollars. That that's that's a nice chunk of change. Um, what was I th I think the uh, ballpark that um, our our friends across the aisle wanted in the division was on the order of 200 million. Or, or maybe a little more, I don't know, but they can speak for themselves. But be somewhere between 70 and 200 million is uh, the, the, the difference of opinion. Uh, and when you look at a $130 million difference of opinion and you go back and you look at these, some of these little players in here that help contribute to, to our, our bill payers, it, it, it's not it's not a whole lot of money and we're putting it into something that I think is going to be critical to the state in the next two years go ahead and Representative Mooney you, you had a comment Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to add to that that with regards to this amendment, as a member of Division Three, I'm quite proud that we formatted it like this. And I want to give a special shout out to Representative Stringham, who introduced this format. Never before has this been laid out so clear and so specific as it does in this amendment. So Representative Stringham did fantastic work with his team in terms of getting us this format that we could work off of. Thank you.
Well, in, in Representative Erf and uh, Representative Hole, then used a very similar format and, and, and came up with different numbers in a way in which there's a methodology that can be explained, an algorithm to allocate money, that if you change how, the amount that to put in, the algorithm will generate the money invested. So it, I, I don't know. It's, I think it's good work um, for a group that aren't professionals. Um, are, President Walner for a question. Yes, thank you. So what this represents, what we're looking at here, is that about half of what um, the Medicaid providers said they felt they needed. Because this all, most of this amendment really came from the work of the provider community. As a coalition, they got together. Um, they had a number of, some providers needed a percentage increase. Some providers needed a, a daily rate increase. I mean, it was it was a variety of ways that they needed to be reimbursed. And these are really providers who, as you heard at the at the hearing, they're very fragile. They are really some of them are. If we lose them, it will be de very detrimental to New Hampshire. I mean, the, the people who do the community uh, work with families where if an elderly family member stays at home instead of going into the nursing home, they can do that work for $20,000 a year to keep someone in their own home on an average, whereas if they go into a nursing home, it's closer to hundreds of thousands of dollars. So these are the providers that really we really need to be sure they're in good shape. This is half of what they told us they need. We've had 14% inflation over the last couple of years. They haven't had a rate increase since two years ago. And some of the providers hadn't had a rate increase for many years before that. So these providers are really, really, the, they are our safety net to keep people out of nursing homes, people with developmental disabilities and higher end services. I and mean, th this is really where we need to focus. And I think providing them with le a lot less than they need, providing them with 50% less than they feel like they need um, could end up being a real problem for the state and for the thousands of people that they serve. So, so if I could, I agree with everything but the last sentence or two uh, of what uh, the representative just said. And uh, I, what, what, I, what I have attempted to say is we have a framework with an algorithm. If we had more money, we could put it in there and it'd just be a math problem. Uh, so, so not knowing how much money we would have as a finance committee, we, we took a best shot at keeping Division Three within some guardrails so that we could come to an event like this. And, and if there were extra money, I, I'd certainly be open to putting it into this program. But um, so that's where we're at. Yeah, Difference between, you know, uh, 90... Uh, ninety four point two million on our side, and and maybe you know twenty two hundred and twenty four on the other. Any number in between there is, you know, a number. Representative Walner for the. No, it's just that my seatmate here was informing me of of how much nursing home care cost, and um, maybe. <laughs> yeah, what well, we found out on our Merrimack County budget. It's it's something like four hundred thousand uh, dollars a resident for our Merrimack County home. I mean, it's just an absolute incredible amount of money. Okay. Representative Sweeney for a question. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the chair and vice chair of Division Three. This is actually a genuine question that I do not know the answer to. Um, Providers that are benefiting from this, the Medicaid rate reimbursement schedule, the program, especially the, the new one that's been laid out in this amendment to HB2, are they allowed individually as individual units or, or groups to go to the fiscal committee or to the executive council to get funding after the budget is adopted in a emergency need basis? Is that an allowable application or are they 
what we do in the budget is is they're locked in for two years. Okay, so generally, as I understand it, um, people can go to the fiscal committee under two scenarios, uh, and and in both scenarios, it's a it's the state doing it. In scenario one, uh, there's federal funds funding that's been made available, and we have to take a look at the guidelines and the money and figure out if that's consistent with the programs we want to run. Then the other is when a department will come to us and say, there's a transfer that I need to uh, do that exceeds uh, the, the authority that I already have. So in both in those instances, it's the state. I, your question is, can the providers come to us to ask for more money? They can certainly, no, not through the fiscal committee, but they can go to you know Mr. Lipman in the department Say, hey, you got to help us, and you know maybe depending on the flexibility we've given him, he may uh, be able to do something in the next amendment cycle of the MCO contracts to to get the money to them, but through the MCOs, but not no direct payments. Representative Stringham. Yeah, and just in terms of of the numbers that the process uh, revealed that revealed. Um, uh, you know, the first year we, we figured on average it would take about a quarter to update any Medicaid rates. So the Medicaid uh, uh, rate increases actually are three quarters the first year of the second, uh, as there would be the second year of the biennium. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, the total numbers came out to about 175 million or, you know, maybe uh, 80 million or so, 85 million over uh, what came out of, of our uh, department. Uh, this is pro even even with the hospitals kicking in their piece, uh, this isn't keeping up even with inflation. And there was already terrific provider shortages on certain areas. You know, if you can't hire somebody to come in and and take care of somebody for twelve dollars an hour, and that's the rate, uh, it you know the, the rate the rate uh, it, the work isn't going to get done unless unless it's by relative or something else. So. Um, uh, appreciate the hard work that was done and the prioritization on all these, uh, but it is still, as uh, Rep uh, Representative Edwards uh, indicated, uh, probably not enough to keep keep the system from um, further degrading rather than getting close to being back on track. Thank you. I, I'd agree with everything you said. I, I just would point out that that this amendment at least does sixty million more than the governor proposed. So, uh, so I don't think any division created their own sixty million dollar expenditure. Uh, division three did that. Yeah. So, uh, should I go on, Mr. Chair? Okay. Um, so, page twenty-two. Um, we. Uh, okay, the governor and we agree that we have an issue with not enough beds to discharge people out of the ERs into some sort of a follow-on care. We agree to that. So he had three HB2 items that essentially created, um, I'm going to use the term unfunded mandate because although it's not the correct constitutional term in this context, it's the same concept. And that is that uh, he was directing uh, percentages of, of uh, beds that needed to be built, or numbers of beds rather, that needed to be built as a, a, a DRF, uh, designated receiving facilities. And uh, we, we weren't giving them any money to do it. We were telling them to the hospitals to do it anyways, even though we know they have workforce shortages. And in order to staff a bed, they'd have to take staff from somebody else, somewhere else, and put it into the DRF. And 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 that's all being done in a way in which it's a top-down, command-driven uh, government edict. And so it it just didn't seem like the right way to build the capacity that uh, is really needed out there. We agree on the goal, certainly didn't agree on the technique. So we <laughs> struck those three uh, requests. Um, item, or uh, page 23, um, this is uh, the first of two uh, Representative Wallner uh, amendments. This was a good one. 
uh, w she recognized that there we have a Federal Reserve of TANF money. It's approximately 67 million. So she she I did she identified that she said can we can we go ahead and have some of that TANF money fund unemployment related child care services, uh, which are vital to rebuilding the workforce and to avoid a, a wait list. So uh, was this the one that was seven million or two point four million? I didn't write that down, um, but we didn't have a cost. Okay. Then the 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 next one uh, also addresses a workforce issue uh, by adjusting the child care eligibility up, and I I forget the percentage. It's currently I think sixty sixty five percent sixty percent. We we wanted to raise it to eighty five percent, and then we stuck with an eighty five percent of the uh, state availability of services number instead of converting it to the federal poverty levels to be consistent across our statutes. We talked about changing it to an FPL instead of this, but we decided to keep it at the 85% benchmark because the dollar amount between it and 300% was, you know, de minimis. Uh, so, so, and since this language matches the federal language, we thought it might be easier to be consistent with the federal law. So this is a workforce issue, should make uh, access to child care, uh, in theory, a little bit easier uh, because more people will be qualified for it. Um, then on page 25, uh, uh, this was, uh, you know, our way to say, uh, can we adjust the rates at which uh, the child care gets reimbursed? We um, uh, said that there's a couple of different ways that you could do a rate adjustment. Uh, one is to take a look at something called the true cost of care mechanism. Then the other is to take the 75th percentile of a market rate survey. We didn't designate which of those two ways the department could choose, but we gave them the option and said, essentially that's going to raise the reimbursement rates for child care. Presumably, we're gonna find workforce to actually take the higher salaries. The item on 26 and 27 is related to the Prescription Drug Affordability Board, the PDAB, um, uh, this board, uh, the chairman of Division One, and I uh, took interest in uh, from January of last year when a uh, item came before the fiscal committee uh, asking for funding. And so we started to take a look at the statute, and the statute basically creates the um, most autonomous, most powerful little entity in the state. So what this amendment does is it, and it also does it in a way in which a lot of what they do is redundant with other departments. So what we said was, let's go ahead and keep the program. Let's scale it back a little bit. Uh, let's make sure that we uh, take a look at the redundancy issues across the departments within the uh, state government. And, and oh, by the way, GELCAR looked at what was called a fee schedule in the PDAB statute as they were doing rulemaking and unanimously determined that uh, the it was probably an unconstitutional tax. And then they specifically said, uh, you know, this has to be relooked by the legislature because the r way of raising revenue is, is probably uh, inappropriate. So there were two amendments. Both amendments agreed that what we ought to be doing is uh, instead of having them have this unconstitutional tax authority, that we should instead uh, allocate general funds to them. That solved the unconstitutional issue of the, the tax. Also, it, it made sure that this, this group was a little more accountable to uh, the, an elected body. So, so that's what the PDAB uh, amendment uh, does. There's a lot of detail in there. Um, then online, uh, or excuse me, uh, pages, excuse question? Me. Question? Carol McGuire. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, is this amendment compatible with the two or three bills in commerce dealing with the Prescription Drug Affordability Board? 
I'll say yes, but. Uh, the, the yes part is to make sure you're listening to the rest of it. <laughs> but uh, Representative Leishman and I uh, co-sponsored, jointly sponsored both those bills that went to Commerce. This, this, this uh, bill in, in uh, HB2 that's in here is consistent, uh, I think, pretty much line for line with what uh, it, the, um, the current amendment is in Commerce. Commerce is holding at 1010. So this, unfortunately, I, I had asked the chairman to just get it on the floor and let's see where it stands. Um, and it's still, it's going to be retained by the committee. Uh, but yes, remember the word yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Further questions? questions from committee members? Seeing none, please proceed. Okay, so 28, because, you know, we love controversy, uh, we went ahead and took the Senate's version of Medicaid expansion, and based on the, 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 the bill that they passed, I don't remember if it was 22 to 2 or 24 to nothing, they, 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 they passed it on an extremely strong vote, and we're going to be seeing it as a bill later, but um, we, we went ahead and put it into HB2, a administrative thing that we did was we required that any money that goes to pay for the Medicaid expansion bill be um, put into the budget instead of doing this, you know, off the books, slide a hand kind of thing that I think we've been doing. Um, it, it, it just makes it open, makes it transparent. It's good government. Uh, and because this part of the Medicaid program is reimbursed by the federal government at extremely high rates. I think it may be as high as 90% right now instead of the typical um, 60%. And, and we know that it's going to decline at some point to 88%. But we know that the feds are not going to keep this commitment forever to be paying on the order of 90%. So what, what we did in here was we put a, a two-year sunset date on our version. The Senate said make it permanent. Our division said make it two years. I, I, want, I, want, to put, I want to put two years into context for you. This, this is the contract for a managed care organization. This, this represents, you know, five, 600 hours of man hours uh, to put together. Uh, it's, it's put together at the state level by our most senior people in the department, so it's very expensive manpower. Uh, and this is typically one contract for five years. If we do it this way with two years, it's one contract that by the time it gets done is only going to be good for a year. So, so under the two-year provision in here, we're going to be doing one of these essentially every year or every other year spending the manpower. There, there is some good government thought that, that instead of two years, it could be four years, it could be six years, but that's a, that's a discussion. This amendment says two years. Okay. Representative Waller for a question. So I think the department told us how, um, how much time and thought has to go into developing these contracts. And um, five years seemed to be what the standard was for doing this kind of a very involved piece of work. Um, I guess the other part about this whole thing is that there was a commission. And on the commission that studied the Medicaid expansion for the past couple of years, there were several meetings, at the end of it, commission members agreed that this program should continue permanently. And for many of us that were on it, we signed a document saying that we agreed to the commission report. The commission report is available for anyone who wants to see it. Um, so I think that there has been a lot of thought and a lot of work done around um, Medicaid, expand, the expanded Medicaid, and um, the five-year taking it to the five years, I mean, it makes a lot, t taking it permanently and not just um, 
to a two-year or five-year sunset. So I hope that we can continue to work on this issue as it goes forth. And we also are getting, the bill is has passed the Senate and will be coming to us. So there will be hearings and a lot of input here um, around this. I don't even feel that, the, I personally don't even feel this section is necessary. Uh, thank you for that. And I was on that commission with you and somebody heard me say that the commission recommended permanent uh, and I was told that they just reviewed the text and we were uh, ambivalent on the length of time. We said that the legis something to the effect that the legislature ought to consider whether or not to make it permanent. I don't think our commission technically said that. But everything else you, you said, I, I, I basically agree with. Um, if, if instead of two years, we said six years, what would, what would happen would be it would take about a year for the current contracts. There are three of them, with us, so we have three MCOs. It would take about a year for those to expire. And then uh, to, and in that time, we'd get these contracts in place, and these want to be five-year contracts. So if you're just looking at it from a business analyst perspective, there's a strong uh, six-year um, uh, timeline that might be considered. But we want to. So... Um, question from Representative Terklerski. Thank you. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Didn't we hear also that um, putting out the contract or the bid for a two-year contract was not going to attract the number of um, vendors and interest, would not be able to attract a more affordable contract for us because they, they want to bid for a longer term, five-year or longer that in the end, this would probably be a significant additional cost on the state? Your memory of the testimony and mine are the same. Thank you. Uh, but because the chairman said I have to finish at 4 o'clock or something bad happens, I am just pushing through you at this point. You don't have to finish at 4. We'll, we'll t I said we'd likely take a break at 4. Oh, okay. Good, good. Thank you. We'll have, I just got a note that uh, from, I guess it's from the LBA, that since tomorrow, we, although we have 26 bills to exec, I think 16 of them are retained. So I don't expect a lot of discussion on retained bills. So we may have time to, to go into Division Three and in, in, in the in the later part of the day after we finished with all the execing. So we'll plan. And also, I wanted to announce for any other public that's here to listen. Yes, I, I had told you earlier that we'd spend all day tomorrow on. Executing, but now that I look at the number that are on retain, I have a different opinion. So there will be time left to. I hadn't been able to see how many were recommend was retained until today. So there will be time for you tomorrow. So, all right. Uh, thank you, sir. Proceed. So speaking of retained bills, uh, pages 32 and 33 represent House Bill 565 that uh, that uh, the Division Three recommends be retained. Uh, this was sponsored by Representative Megan uh, Murray. Uh, what it does is it uh, takes postpartum care under Medicaid and extends it from three months of eligibility to 12 months. We had testimony from Dr. Ballard, the chief medical officer at DHHS, that the 12 month standard is kind of the, the is clinically appropriate. Um, and so this is uh, this is two hundred thousand dollars. This was FY twenty four uh, only. And Mr. Ripple, is this the one where I was supposed to mention that we need to probably consider an amendment to make this uh, non lapsing so that any money we appropriate is good for FY twenty five as well? If the committee wanted us to change this from to. Uh, for the biennium ending June 30th, 2025, instead of the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2024, that's something we could do as, um, as House Bill 2 is put together. And, and Mr. Chair, I apologize. I, I don't know how this got by Division 3, but it did. And I think Division 3, my guess is that we'd all probably support that for the most part. So you want to change this rather than a one year to a two year? Yes, sir, without changing the dollar amount. I, I, I think that was just an oversight. Apologies. Okay. okay, so. Mr. Ripple has is the ability to do that. Okay. 
Representative Sorry. Talersky. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Do we know if that amount was budgeted for the two years and it's just a technical error in the writing or if we need that amount for each year? In the hurried huddle in between changes, uh, there was a quick agreement that 200000 was the right amount. Uh, amongst the legislators without me talking to the LBA or to the department, but it, my understanding is 200000 for the two years was acceptable and that we just need to make it non-lapsing. And right now, Mr. Ripple is taking a look, or I think, whether or not it's it ought to be 400000 or should kept at two hundred. Do you, Do you have a quick one, Mr. Uh, White? You don't know. No, all right. Well, I don't know what the intent was of the sponsor or of the policy committee that the bill came out of. Um, if you look at the fiscal note, it's, it reflects um, a higher figure per year. It reflects an estimated cost of between 300000 to $1 million per fiscal year. So I, I don't want to do budgeting on the fly. Mm -hmm. I, we had an agreement that we would just make it non-lapsing. So since we can only do one amendment, I'd, I'd suggest doing that. Okay. Repres or, uh, on pages 34, 36, this is another retained bill. This is uh, HB 91. This is a bill uh, that uh, the House uh, voted on. We voted on it twice now, by the way. We voted on the, almost exactly the same bill in the previous term. This would already be law, but it was taken hostage in a committee of conference and, and, and was killed as part of a failed negotiation. But, but HB 91, establishes a couple of requirements on the Department of Health and Human Services to form a privacy council that's consistent with corporate standards. Uh, it also establishes a risk mitigation approach and it funds um, a couple of specialists that have the training. And somehow, after all this time, this is another one that got by me, got by us, but I'll, I'll take full responsibility. On line 24, it says it's $300,000 for the fiscal year ending in 2024. This should have been non-lapsing, and this one I know is meant to be $300,000 per term. So I, I would ask Mr. Ripple to prepare an amendment for us to vote on you know, tomorrow that makes it $300,000 a year for two years each. I think in this case and the previous case, this is something you could do verbally without a new amendment being presented to you. I, I, I don't know. I defer to the chairman on those. I think those were the only two where we had this issue, right? You, do you want to vote on on the going from uh, 300,000 one year for 300,000 two years? I think if... Um, I think this change is uncontroversial enough that we could we, meaning the LBA, could make this change as a technical change um, if the committee opts to adopt this amendment packet. So I don't think you need to take another vote on this item specifically. You don't think we need to have a vote now? How about the previous one? It's If you would like to take a vote, by all means do, but I think this item is technical enough in nature that it's something that we could just do on, your, on the committee's behalf. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this, at this end of this meeting, I will be making a, uh, an announcement that I hereby authorize the LBA to make any technical and mechanical changes necessary to reflect the intent of the committee. So if that's acceptable to everybody, that's what I will make at the end of this. And then that allows them, to, especially on divisions one and two, to go in and make anything that's been brought up that needs to be corrected. And then at the end of the final, at the final end of division three, I'll make that same announcement so they can begin working on technical and mechanical uh, corrections that have been identified. So without objection, that's the way they will proceed. Is there any objection to that? 
Seeing none, that's how we will proceed. Uh, should I continue with the next item, page 37? Um, this uh, was another retained bill sponsored by uh, Representative Joe Shapiro. Uh, it's it's uh, formally known as House Bill 282. Um, it uh, uh, correctly identified $336,000 as being needed, uh, allocated in FY24, and just said it was going to be non-lapsing. This will be used uh, to uh, for uh, the children and pregnant women in Medicaid and CHIP, which is otherwise known as the Children's Health Insurance Program. Okay, on page... 38, this was uh, formerly known as House Bill 614. Uh, we've uh, recommended retaining, uh, and this is related to um, the water situation in Merrimack. Uh, this bill is the, uh, the godchild of uh, Representative Mooney. Do you want to say anything on this, Representative Mooney? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to remind everyone that Merrimack is the location of the worst PFAS contamination in the country. This bill would authorize phase three of a feasibility study on the increased amount of kidney cancers in the Merrimack, the town of Merrimack region. Only twice, twice in 10 years, has a feasibility study been recommended to go from phase two to phase three because of the severity of the circumstance? And this is one of those instances. So with that, uh, I would like to actually mention Representative Nancy Murphy, who was the sponsor prime of House Bill 614, and that exact language to have that feasibility study go from phase two to three. It will be in House Bill 2 soon, I hope, with your support. Thank you. Can you describe what phase three might entail? As I understand it, phase three is a more concentrated effort on the community in order to um, make the uh, feasibility study known better and to communicate with those who have been affected or think they may have been affected in order to do a deeper study into the increase in cancer numbers. So it likely will be the first time there'll be a human study. All the all the uh, reports I read are all rodent studies, and they don't really get into humans. They just say, we think this, we think that, based upon the, the rodent study. So this would be the first time, perhaps, that we'll have a human study. I, I, and I, I think we all know it, but it's still worth mentioning. This passed the House Policy Committee and the House vote. So, um, all right. Uh, moving on to uh, page 39, the last in the package. Um, the very first hearing of Division Three, where we heard that to bring a kid into the Sununu Center required a strip search, we all acted as one to say that's unacceptable. Is there an alternative? And the department was ready with an alternative pretty quickly where they can uh, put a full body scanner in there and uh, allow the intake of the uh, detainee uh, with uh, more dignity than a, first, than a strip search upon you know, first greeting. And given the importance of a trauma-informed therapeutic-based care center, uh, the body scanner is more appropriate. So what we did, um, because this was a, it, the estimate was 300,000. So we put a, a not to exceed 325,000. We did it with the ex expectation that the service costs would be included in that initial contract. So we'd get through the fiscal year at least, if not more. Um, uh, the department agreed to eat that money out of the budget that the governor had already approved. We then also reduced their budget a million dollars a year because they had budgeted overtime. And in order to help them meet the commitment to get the body scanner and the get to keep the personnel on site that are needed and other expenses for the next two years, we granted them a great deal of transfer authority so that they can manage the money that we do give them. And so with that flexibility, uh, the department was, was okay at this point with uh, the proposal. 
And so, sir, with that, I'm, I'm done with the thick package and the short package. All of these are basically HB2 references. Um, it's approaching 4 o'clock. I'll, I'll do what you'd like. Here's my thought. Since we have a couple of substitute people with us today who have heard all this discussion, and they may not be with us tomorrow, um, if we go to do your HB1 piece tomorrow when we have different people, then I would, unusual to the first two divisions, I would like to make a separate vote for your presentation on HB2 if there's no objection since, as I said, we have some substitutes and I want to make sure that the people who have heard the discussion are the people who vote. So I'll ask the, the clerk to, the motion will be to accept the HB2 amendments from Division 3 that have been briefed thus far. And I'll, I'll say the motion is made by Representative Edwards to be seconded by Representative Mooney. And is there any further discussion or questions on that process? Seeing none, uh, Representative Walner. Well, even though I have spent the last several months here working on the Division Three um, amendments and the presentation, I am going to vote no. I still feel that the uh, Medicaid reimbursement rates are too important to not um, fund them at a higher level, so that we don't we don't um, take the chance of losing any of these really important providers. And I'm also very concerned about um, the um, Medicaid um, expansion that's in this in House Bill 2, I think it's completely unnecessary to have it there. Thank you. Further discussion? Representative Kofal. I'm sorry, that's Ringham's. Thank you. Um, I, did, I wanted to mention that I deeply appreciate the input from all, my, all uh, the division representatives uh, with the intelligence, hard work, and creativity. Uh, particularly grateful for the chair, co-chair, Mr. Ripple, uh, and I appreciate uh, the hard work and diligence to prioritize and fund the services, uh, which is the Medicaid rates. And um, um, uh, I, like um, uh, like Representative Walner, do come down that we're too far short for me to be able to vote for this amendment at this time uh, because of the, um, uh, the potential risk to the Medicaid system at this level of funding. Uh, but um, um, I, I acknowledge the great work that was done and uh, uh, hope that it can continue to progress from here. Thank you. Further from committee members? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion to accept the HB2 um, presentation from Division Three, as amended by the division. Clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Ruff. Yes. Representative McGuire. Yes. Representative Petrie votes yes. Representative Emmerich. Yes. Representative Griffin. Yes. Representative Mooney. Yes. Representative Edwards. Yes. Representative Carol McGuire. Yes. Representative Kofalt. Yes. Representative Sweeney. Yes. Representative Campbells. Yes. Representative Popovici Muller. Yes. Representative Walner. No. Representative Norgren. No. Representative Leishman. Yes. Representative Bucco. Yes. Representative Grassi. No. Representative Hewitt. No. Representative Heath. No. Representative Murray. No. Representative Ebel. No. Representative Tolerski. No. Representative Haken Phillips. No. Representative Stringham. No. Representative uh, Weiler. Yes. Mr. Chairman, the vote is 15 to 10 in affirmative. The motion is adopted. And again, I will make the uh, authorization to LBA to make any technical and mechanical changes necessary to reflect the intent of the committee on this piece. Uh, we'll do the final one when we brief on HB1 tomorrow after the exec session. So any of you that are interested that I told earlier we'd just be doing exec session, 
No, we will be returning to HB1 as amended by Division Three after we uh, work on the exec session for all the bills. Um, it may be somewhere in the afternoon. Representative Edwards. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, I, I, I think I'm aware of another amendment that may be brought forward also. Typical, or like you did with the other divisions after the vote, we also talked about other amendments, and we may have at least one of those. I will say that we are open to amendments to HP2 that may come tomorrow when we get back to Division Three's briefing. So uh, I, I'd like to see all the uh, division chairs uh, in my office when we, when we complete here. Thank you. And uh, we'll, we'll go on recess f for today and come back tomorrow at 10 to begin the exec session on the, I think it's 26 bills. Thank you all for your attendance. Thank you all for your cogitation. Good night.